Yeah, th- this has become the the museum. Know, right? Yeah, o- over here, this is my dad's wall. This was my dad served in World War II. It was in Okinawa, Tinian, Saipan. That's a flag that he actually got from Okinawa. That's crazy. Sword he got off a uh, Japanese NCO. Uh, what a this, this this side over here is more the Afghanistan Iraq side. Yeah. And we got ran, random crap from all over the place. <laughs> You've just been around too much. <laughs> That's true. Did. I've been uh, all the wrong places at the right I know, times. Right? Yeah. Did you and your dad talk about his time in World War II at all? Yeah. You know, it's interesting is that when I was a little kid, I used to go to all of his Marine Corps reunions every two years. So I'd get to hang out with all these Marines that, you know, were World War II vets. And I didn't really appreciate it, you know, when I was like 10 yeah. years old, 11 years old, and then you know, as you know, I got older and then they all of a sudden thought that I should start drinking probably about 15 or whatever. Nice. <laughs> my dad would go, he'd hit the rack and uh, they'd start telling me stories about, like, yeah, your dad, you know, he was the bravest officer we ever saw and this, that and the other thing. He never showed any fear. And, you know, we'd be coming in, landing on the beaches. We keep looking at the lieutenant as long as he wasn't scared. We knew yeah. we'd be good. And uh, so I talked to my dad about that. I was like, dad, how come you were never scared? And he's like, are you kidding me? He goes, I was terrified. I said, well, how come the Marines, they said you were never scared? He goes, well, that's something else. That's what the Marine Corps taught me is to maintain my bearing and to show the, this presence of command leadership and courage under fire. And I had no idea what he was talking about, but I was like, I got to get some of that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so uh, that motivated me to join the Corps when I was a little kid. That's crazy, man. That's um, To have a relative that served in World War II – and is willing to talk about it. I think it's probably not a common thing. You know what I'm saying? And the fact that, and you got to yeah. hang out with his buddies, you know, which give you the real story, <laughs> you know, which tell you like what really well, happened. Well, exactly. And that was the cool thing is that like I, I originally enlisted. And then later on when, you know, I became an officer, like my whole perspective of being a Marine was what it was like to be in mm-hmm. combat and all these stories about how they would jerry rig stuff, how they'd steal stuff from the army and all the rest of these stories. And I'm like, yeah, that that's what you do. And, you know, I, I was surrounded by a lot of officers that, you know, grown up in the garrison Marine Corps, which, you know, they're all about spit shining boots, starching camis mm-hmm. and all the rest. So it was a, you know, I, I, fortunately there was a lot of operational things going on. So I was able to fit in, in that environment, not so much in the garrison yeah, world. No, I, I totally get it. I totally get you. That's so crazy that you got to, I mean, for me, I I really appreciate that. I I don't know if the average person appreciates the fact that you got to like walk amongst and talk to these legends of World War II, you know, that these, it's like every Marine Corps birthday, half the the ball video is about World War II and, and the stuff that those dudes did and stuff like that. And to be able to, I've, I've reached out to a few people to have, try to get a world war two vet on this, on the podcast. It's obviously harder for someone that's a little older to get into the technology and stuff like that. But it's just like, those stories are what an amazing, I don't know what a, an amazing time to have been in the military and probably scary as shit too. You know, like your dad was saying, yeah. um, it's funny. Uh, I had one of my Marines said something about, you know, sounding calm on the radio. Cause I was a JTAC when I was in, I don't know if you know too much about my background, but no, I don't. Please share. I just, I just remember telling him, like, dude, I got scared every time I fucking pushed a button down, man. You get nervous every time you're. I'm about to, <laughs> I'm about to direct aircraft, you know, to drop bombs, like training. No, no matter what, it's that's that makes you nervous. Like you just kind of. I got to the point. I was a JTAC evaluator. I got up to that point, so I got to, even then, even awesome. then, I'd be like, fuck, I, you know, because you know, everyone's listening. Everyone's got their radio listening to how the control is going and how the mission's going, and it's like. um I just I'd tell myself, be like, oh, dude, you 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 have way more experience than all these guys. Why are you even nervous? You know, <laughs> like don't, I don't know. And and I'll tell you, I I got dropped on by A tens during the first Gulf War. We had thousand pound cluster Ugh. bombs pepper our freaking position. So that was probably the scariest situation I'd ever been in. You know, when you're when you're in the off- offensive, you don't have time to mm-hmm. be scared. But when you're sitting there in a defensive posture, and then all of a sudden the world just starts. Like literally the ground starts waving, everything just starts turning upside down. 
fortunately, I had my whoopee, yeah. you know, I had my freaking poncho liner, so I was able to cover myself with that. So that, that kept me alive. A but that was terrifying. I can't imagine, <laughs> man. I've uh, I was talking I had my buddy Paul Smith on the other day. He was the uh, first Marine Division JTAC manager. And, um, he talked about being out on one of the training OPs out here and one of the JTACs, they, it was a nighttime operation or nighttime training evolution. And they were marking with an IR pointer, which is obviously you can only see with NVGs, right? Well, on the ground, someone opened a car door and the pilot thought that that was the end of the pointer. He saw that and thought that was the mark and dropped a 500 pound, uh, training bomb. Luckily, it was training because it landed like 10 meters from him, is what he said. He said it fucking just slammed wow. right into the rental car uh, or right next to the rental car Jeez. that they had, they had gotten. I'm like, man, you know, those close calls, it happens. I I almost got hit by an arty round at Camp Lejeune, a 155 round hit. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, OP5, that area, but we we had a round yeah. land 50 yep. meters from us and the little, like that cul-de-sac area right next to OP5, it hit right there in that little cul-de-sac kind of thing. What is it? I there were, well, I, I'm sure there's been more than one incident, but it was funny because I was actually down Lejeune probably about two years ago, and somebody was telling me a story about that, where I think uh, the CG was briefing everybody out, and all of a sudden it was like, I gotta go, and I, I think you know round came danger close, and and I don't know if anybody got taken out in that incident, but it's uh, it's it, a dangerous it job, you know. It's a this is uh it's. It's a dangerous job, and it's very paramount that the people that are in these like combat arms jobs, these cannoneers, like in our case, the the gun chief didn't verify the powder before they put the powder in, so they only put half the charge in that they were supposed to, and it landed outside of the impact area. So it's like one of those things. Like I think sometimes pe- we take it for granted because we're around all this craziness all the time, just from being in the Marine Corps. You take True. it for granted, like the, the safety aspect, and sometimes. When something goes wrong, it goes horribly wrong because we're dealing with explosives or we're dealing with like these tens of thousands of pound vehicles. And, you know, it's crazy. I do want to ask you, though, you sh- you showed a flag yeah. that your dad had brought back, that Japanese flag. I saw a post the other day. There was a guy on one of the military pages was like, hey, this is my grandfather's Japanese flag that he had, he had gotten off a dude um, and he had left it to him. And he was uh, trying to return it to the family, um, to the Japanese family. Interesting. And there was like mixed like responses to that. Like some people were like, that's cool. Sure. That's really good for the family. It'll give them closure. And other people are like, your grandfather should have never given you that flag. I can't believe you're trying to give it away <laughs> kind of deal. What are your kind of thoughts on stuff like that? Like, is that something you think? Like you have a flag and a sword. Do you think you would ever attempt to even, has that even crossed your mind trying to get that back? Or is it like, Hey man, this is something from his time and it's something that honors his service. That's interesting. I ne- never even thought about it. Uh, you know, it, it, it was purely, you know, and still is, you know, one of those things, which, you know, my father's service having uh, landed in Okinawa, Tinian, Saipan and all the rest, uh, that was sort of, uh, you know, the memento, the reminder, you know, I lost my father, you know, he passed away about 10 years ago. And, you know, I look at that and I remember him and, uh, you know, I'm going to think about that returning it though, you know, cause you know, we're obviously not at war with Japan anymore. As a matter of fact, we're, we're allies Mm -hmm. and, uh, we may actually be fighting side by side with the Japanese someday, depending upon what goes down in the Pacific with China and uh, Taiwan and all the rest. So, uh, I, I had an interesting experience uh, at business school where we were talking about uh, how do you develop creativity? And the whole course was how do you, as a leader, manage and, and inspire people to be creative? And then we had this whole section on destructive creativity. Mm-hmm. And of course, the topic went to the nuclear bomb. And, you know, the whole class was how horrible it was that we created the nuclear bomb. It was horrible. And of course, you know, I raised my hand. I said, listen, my dad was on Okinawa. He actually flew back to Iwo Jima, had the landing plans for mainland Japan handcuffed to his wrist, flew them back to Okinawa and watched them getting briefed out. Had we not dropped the nuclear bomb, my father would not have survived and I wouldn't be here to this day. What was wild is there was actually a kid from Hiroshima. His family survived and he was in the class and he was talking about how horrible and devastating it was. And so it was a very wow. interesting dialogue back and forth between you know, him and I, and it's like, you know, war is a horrible thing. And uh, it's one of those things where it's up to the, the citizens to keep in check their governments and 
make sure that they're not they're not acting with unbridled yeah. aggression which is why we act with war to stop unbridled sure. aggression yeah i think that's well two things on what you just said like one that's crazy that what a small world that, <laughs> that a bizarre you, you know you're the son of someone that would have been affected by it in the same room you know just happened to be in the same class as someone whose family bizarre. got hit by the atomic bomb like and what a small world one and two what an amazing country that we have where we can have those two types of people in the same room together and have a discussion without you guys like going at it or there should be some kind of family blood <laughs> feud, you know, something like that, you know, like that's not something you would see in True. other countries or something like that. I don't believe. Um, no, I agree. Man, that's crazy, dude. You have so many like weird <laughs> links to all this like stuff. That's insane. Well, I'll tell you another weird one just because of the timing is that yesterday was the, uh, End of the, uh, or marks marks the 70th anniversary of the end of the battle in the Chosin mm-hmm. Reservoir from the Korean War, and uh, my uncle was actually awarded a silver a silver star from that Man. battle for taking command of a battalion that had pretty much stalled, and he he was in the army, and he actually fought them up to link up with Chesty Puller, the first Marines, and they fought up in uh, Kotori, wow. and. Uh, just while, so I posted a whole bunch of pictures and a brief story about him uh, on Facebook just yesterday. So just kind of interesting time. Yeah, that's um, again, uh, that's another group of people I'd love to I'd love to try to get on the on the show is because what we see in combat today is completely different than what those guys were doing then. You know, the that was definitely more of a war of attrition. The casualties were much higher. The technology was way less, which meant that there were more casualties. I mean, and, and here's the real wild thing. So in 1996, I was actually in the operations section of uh, one Marine expeditionary force out in California. And I invited my mm-hmm. uncle to come be a guest out there for the birthday ball. And he showed up in his dress blues and he was like, 78 years old. And what was wild is, you know, we started hanging out. I introduced him to everybody. Next thing you know, the CG, General Fulford, and, and all the rest of these guys, they're all around him because our mission at the time was constantly going over to uh, Korea and sitting here doing the planning, coordinating, training to prepare to go back to the Korean Peninsula. And he had actually, my uncle had actually walked the ground that we were constantly evaluating. And so next thing you know, they're sitting around like a pile of mashed potatoes. Like, look, you can't go there in Cota Rhee because this is going to be here and the terrain is this and that. I mean, it was just the wildest thing. And it it was an amazing experience for me, obviously, to see my uncle talking about his combat experience and the Marines embracing him. He wrote me a, uh, a note afterwards saying, look, that was the greatest experience of my life. I always loved serving with the Marines. It was great to reunite mm-hmm. with the Marines. And uh, unfortunately... Uh, he ended up passing away six months after that yeah. event. But, you know, it was great that in his world, he was able to get some closure and come back together and to be honored in such a way. And so, have uh, like a real world effect, just, man. I uh, bet some of the stuff he told him went yeah. into some O plans, you know, like went down the line and like, <laughs> absolutely. that's so crazy. Absolutely. I think if, if any of my listeners don't have not read anything or, or studied on the Korean war at all, I have a couple books like, uh, give me tomorrow. is a really good book. Um, the cover of it is just a powerful image of a kid um, that I think a time photographer took his photo and, and he took his photo right when he asked him like, what, uh, what, if you could ask for anything, what would it be? And he said, give me tomorrow. And so the whole book is about wow. the Korean war there. And then obviously last stand uh, Fox company, which is another amazing, like uh, title of Korean war. Here, here's a couple that uh, my dad or my uncle's written oh, up nice. in because I was just reviewing these and, uh, you know, it kind of tells the story. And a lot of them, a lot of the stories are kind of sanitized. Yeah. But when my uncle told me the actual story of what happened and how he had to, he was a major, he was a, a staff officer. And uh, General Almond with 10th Corps told him, hey, go down and get this freaking battalion moving. And he goes down there and finds this battalion snowed over and they're paralyzed with fear and, and hunger and, and all the rest. And he's like, hey, Lieutenant Colonel, you need to get your uh, your battalion moving north. You need to attack north. And this lieutenant colonel says, listen, Major, we're not moving. We're sitting here. We're hungry. We're tired. We're cold. It's not happening. And my uh, uncle basically turned to the radio operator and said, company commander's up. 
and he's like, what the hell are you doing? He goes, sir, stand relieved. I've assumed command of your battalion. And this freaking major, Major Gerfine, takes command of his battalion and gets them moving up north, and they engage the enemy. First time, they, they uh, hit a booby trap uh, from some blockage in the road, and the lead elements start turning and start overrunning the freaking mm -hmm. command element. And uh, my uncle talks about he took his, took his 45 out and said, turn the hell around. And they said, no, we're going to get killed. He goes, you might, but you definitely will if you try running beyond yeah. me. And uh, turned him around and then fought. The rear came under machine gun fire. He went and led them through all this. Ends up getting up there, linking in. He actually had a note from, it said, you know, set up your uh, battalion on the reverse slope of Hill 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Chesty. I'm like, you got a personal note from Man. Chesty Puller? He goes, yeah, we got attached to them. I was like, holy crap. And by then, the battalion commander was all warmed up. Everything was good. So he flew back. What was interesting is he was gone for so long, the headquarters wrote his obituary and sent it back to New York. Everybody thought oh, he was shit. dead. And when he comes back into the command, they're like, instead of being like, hey, you're a hero. Good job. They're like, where the hell have you been? Next thing you know, like, listen, you've got a stack of paperwork on your desk. Hey, you all this back to work. Yeah. Go be a staff officer. <laughs> So it took a while for the story to come out, but uh, it eventually Man, did. Man, that's so crazy, dude. That's uh, what a <laughs> what a unique like. Uh, it sounds like your family history is just rich. Like they've been in all these like uh, all these key engagements. It's in, and... it's in my freaking it's in my DNA. My mom was inducted into the nursing corps in World War II in mm. England, and so you know I grew up with the whole concept of what my mom would refer to, she's British, noblesse oblige, that those who have the ability have a responsibility to serve mm -hmm. others. And so, you know, I, people are like, hey, you know, how, how can you have enlisted when you're 17 and gone and served and gone in multiple conflicts? I'm like, I, I, I didn't know there was a choice. <laughs> it's just sort of how I was yeah, brought up. I, I, it, the military was kind of a, a thing for me. I, I always knew, my dad was in the army. I never had, there was no Marines in my family. I was the first Marine. Um, my, I had a grandfather in the army as well. And then a grandfather that was in the air force. And then I had like uncles and stuff that were like, you know, served in different branches. And, um, yep. I think when you come from like a military background, when you have that military history, although I can never really remember my talking about it with my dad so much, he wasn't a combat arms guy. He was a, uh, when he first came in, he was a missile repair man, I think, or something like that on the, on the, the missiles during, um, <laughs> He came in at the end of Vietnam War, but they didn't send him to Vietnam. They sent him to Germany to go work on like the missile defense systems. And then he then he started working for the combat support hospital because he went into the reserves and stuff and did Desert Storm. But I think watching him go right. to Desert Storm as a kid and seeing all that and then obviously now becoming more interested in it and watching military stuff, you know, obviously shaped my mindset to like this is like, oh, I'm going to do something else. Like I didn't even – you know, in high school, I didn't even take my SATs or anything because I'm like, what, why would I waste my time I'm going to the military, you know? Exactly. I, I'm the same way. I cut out of high school, beginning of my senior year, went down the recruiter because, you know, I heard if you went to college, you had to read books. And I was like, I'm not doing that. That's a thing. And so, uh, <laughs> so I showed up uh, at the recruiter and, uh, you know, Gunny you know, basically says, uh, hey, so, you know, you do drugs? I said, no. He goes, uh, you going to graduate? I said, I, I think so. He's like, you're in good shape? I said, yeah, captain, football, wrestling, lacrosse, you know, all good. He's like, all right, well, we could have you enlist today. I was like, seriously? I said, well, hold on a second. I said, look, my dad always made me work for everything that, you know, I wanted to do. So I'm going to have to pay for this myself. So how much is this going to cost? He goes, son, are you sure you don't do drugs? <laughs> and that, that was the beginning. And then when I told him, I, you know, he's like, well, what do you want to do? I want to be a Marine. He's like, well, look, we got a lot of jobs yeah. in the Marine Corps. You know, you get aviation, you get mechanic, you could be a, you know, culinary school, this and that. And I'm like, no, I want to be a Marine. And he goes, well, like what? I said, so I pointed at the poster, like some Marine all cammied up, running around with his M16. He goes, you want to be infantry? I said, you know, call what you want. I said, I want to be a Marine. Yeah. He's like, holy crap, we got a live one here, guaranteed infantry. Yeah. Was that, what year was this? Uh, that was 82. Was there a lot of people going into the Marine infantry at that time? Probably not. Um, you know, I, I think that it was an interesting time. Well, it, it was an interesting time in that there was a lot of tension with Iran mm -hmm. at the time and uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini. And so, the, you know, there was a sense of patriotism. My high school had very few people 
going in the military. My high school had a lot of smart kids who were going to Ivy League schools. And uh, it turned out that, unbeknownst to me, one of my other classmates actually showed up as we were heading down to boot camp. And he was actually in my platoon oh, at boot cool. camp. But yeah, it was pretty cool. And then you got to remember, right around then, you also had Beirut mm -hmm. bombing that happened just after that. And so there was definitely, you know, some tension and some patriotism. And Re Reagan had recently just taken over and had just put a lot of money in fixing the military from where uh, Carter had pretty much decimated yeah. it. Yeah, it seems to be the trend. And so it was an interesting so, time. Well, you, you came in and listed, but all your family was officers. What, what's the deal with that? Were they okay with it? <laughs> well, my, my, my dad actually enlisted oh, first. Okay. My, dad had, he, my dad had a very interesting story. He uh, actually was a, a NIT championship basketball player in New York. So he had a wow. big name. And in his junior year, the, uh, the media at the time, which was the New York Times, said, hey, um, the Army has this Army Air Corps one-day enlistment program. You know, would you be interested in uh, joining? He goes, yeah, sure. He goes, great. We're going to do this whole spread on you. Takes him down. New York Times ran multiple photographs, full half-page uh, story of Art Gerfine going to enlist in the Army Air Corps. is a big, you know, media hit. And... Uh, he goes down, well, at the end of the, the whole enlistment process, like, hey, we want to get one more photograph of you off to fight the war with your suitcase in your hand. He goes, suitcase? I don't have a suitcase. I just came from school. <laughs> He's like, all right, here, grab this suitcase. So you take a picture of him. The media's like, great, we're going to run it tomorrow morning. My dad's like, all right. And he you know, goes to take off. And the recruiter's like, hey, son, where are you going? He goes, I'm going home. He goes, no, get your ass on the train. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. This is just a publicity event. He goes, bullshit. You signed the paperwork. Oh, Get man. on the train. He goes, all right, can I? He goes, can I at least tell my mom and dad? And so they're like, fine, go tell your mom and dad and then get on the first train tomorrow morning. So he goes home, says, mom, dad, guess what I did? I, I joined the Army Air Corps. And then they go, the hell you did? He goes, we already have one son at West Point. You're not going anywhere. Go to your room, no dinner for you. And he's like, what? So the next morning, his dad opens the newspaper, sees all these photographs oh of him, and so he goes, hey, honey, I think we better let him go. So he goes down, does all his basic training, but what ends up happening is he was six foot seven, so he couldn't fit in the trainers in, in, the, in the planes at the time. So they gave him an honorable discharge, said thanks for playing. He goes back to New York, plays his senior year of basketball back at N N y uh, LIU. Uh, they have a great season, and then he's like, well, the war is still going on. And he goes down to enlist in the Marines. And what ends up happening is the recruiter looks at him. He goes, son, how tall are you? He goes, six, seven. It's like, sorry, six, five's the cutoff. Like, what do you mean six, five? There's a freaking war yeah. going on. Come on. And he goes, look, the only guys we're giving waivers to are those who have prior service with honorable discharges. Yeah. He pulls out his paperwork. Next thing you know, he enlists, goes to Paris Island, but ends up getting picked up for an officer commissioning program. And uh, ends up serving as an officer. But what was wild is when I came home that following day and I said, hey, dad, guess what? I enlisted in the Marine Corps. He goes, the hell you did. You can't, he goes, you can't take a shit on your own until you're 18 years old. I was like, what? He goes, you don't have my permission. You can't do anything. I'm like, well, and as I'm sitting there talking to my dad, the recruiter comes to the door. <laughs> He's standing there. His deltas. He's like, ding dong. My dad snapped back into Marine Corps captain mode. He's like, you wait outside, you up in my room. <laughs> and all of a sudden my dad's like, what in the fuck are you thinking? And I'd never heard my dad curse before. I said, dad, I enlisted. He's like, the hell you did. He goes, what, what the hell do you, why would you even think about that? So dad, I, I want to be like you. He goes, all right, well, that's a good argument. I can't argue yeah. with that one. <laughs> so he signed the paperwork and, uh, Next thing you know, you know, it was all good. Had a great run Man, for money. That what that, what a crazy tale. That's uh, that's some stuff that would happen during World War II like that. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the only kind of era that uh, you know you get made, you get put in the newspaper and all that stuff. What a wild time. And he's six seven. Jeez, what a what a like tall person to be like in charge. You know, just walking around looking down on everybody. Like, oh, he was probably super intimidating. Right. Well, and that's the thing. Well, well, and the troops used to joke. They were like, yeah, whenever we'd land on the beaches, it took three of us to, to dig a fighting position for him because he was so damn tall. <laughs> yeah, probably exactly. <laughs> Jeez, man. 
That's crazy. Well, I want to get into more of your your background and stuff, but I know you're on the show today to to talk about something else. You're here with uh, United uh, American Patriots. So if you want to kind of get into, you know, what we're here to discuss, I, I, I want to say that I you sent me over a bunch of information about these cases that we're going to talk about. I have only been able to, like, barely skim over them because I've done – yeah, I've no done worries. two podcasts this weekend, and I've done – all my papers that this is like I told you before it's on my final week. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to feel like uh, I don't want you to feel like I'm not interested or I'm blowing off the information you sent me. I just, I, I'm, I'm not going to have a lot of feedback. So I'll just ask questions as no they worries. come up, but go ahead and uh, kind of explain what, what you guys do and, and what you're here today for. Yeah. So right now is an interesting time because uh, you know, depending upon what happens with this election, uh, Either way, President Trump is definitely considering pardons for various different people. And uh, we have eight warriors that uh, we're, we've actually put forward requests for pardons or uh, uh, commutations of sentence, reductions in mm -hmm. sentences. And uh, our organization, United American Patriots, has been fighting for warriors since 2005, actually a, a Vietnam vet. Major Donahue, guy with multiple Purple Hearts, Silver Star, Bronze Star, uh, absolute warrior. He founded this organization after he saw some United States Marines, uh, Hamdaniya and Haditha Marines, being paraded through the streets in orange jumpsuits with shackles on and congressmen calling them murderers before they'd even been accused of anything. And he said, listen, this is just wrong, that regardless of whether or not these warriors have done something wrong, they deserve to have their rights protected. They protect our rights. They must have that equal due process and the presumption of innocence. He actually mortgaged his own home to start United American wow. Patriots. And since then, we've been fighting for warriors. And our mission is to make sure that we're keeping the president, Congress, and the general public aware of what's going on, to uh, help raise funds for their legal defense, and also to help them with transition after we get them out of prison. And last year, we were able to uh, help facilitate three pardons for warriors. We were able to get uh, two warriors paroled, and we were able to get five cases overturned. And so we're continuing to fight for these warriors. And uh, why this is an interesting time is that, you know, the president has come out and said that, you know, we're going to end these endless wars, as he refers to them, talking about Iraq and Afghanistan. And... Uh, we're actually our nation's in negotiations with the Taliban, releasing thousands of Taliban warriors, 150 of whom were, were sitting on death row for the most atrocious, horrific crimes you could imagine from rape, murder, torture, you name it. And all of these people are going to be set free. And none of them have served more than 18 years in, in either Gitmo or any other detention facility because the conflicts, you know, has only been go going on 19 years now. So, so that being said, at the end of the day, the only warrior or the only warriors across the board who are still going to be in prison or are still going to have their lives impacted by being prosecuted are United States warriors. So this is where when you look at the history that, you know, we've never had any war criminals sit in prison for more than a decade. And even William Calley, who uh, he he was charged and convicted of killing 116 civilians. He only spent three days or three years in house arrest with maybe a day in prison. So now we've got warriors who are coming up on a decade and more sitting in Leavenworth, and we're going to continue to fight for them. And when we get challenged, a lot of the questions are, well, these guys have done some really bad things. And the answer is maybe, because a lot of times what happens is, our uniform code of military justice does not assume the presumption of innocence. And they, there's very quick rush to judgment, especially when there's political motivation behind this. And so sometimes there's just not the evidence to convict. However, which I didn't even know, you know, after serving 25 years in the Marines, that we don't, we don't necessarily uh, have the same rights as civilians. And so, for example, hold That's on a fine. second here. Hey guys. Hey. Gotta love dogs, man. Yeah, I know. I got three labs. They're oh, wow. awesome. It's a lot of energy. But there is. 
So with the Uniform Code of Military Justice, you don't even need a unanimous jury to convict people of capital offenses. Only need three quarters of the jury. And when you have one convening authority, a general who's sitting over both the prosecution and the defense and is picking the jurors that's coming from their own command, that they're pretty much setting individuals up for failure or for conviction. Like we've had times where there's 98% conviction rates of our warriors who've been put up for court martial. And in our judicial system, in the civilian world, the, hmm. there's a presumption of innocence. And then you go to court and then there'll be a determination. Pretty much most people believe if you're going to a general court martial, well, you're guilty. And that's just simply not the case. And so this is where, you know, we're fighting for warriors who uh, they, they get convicted of murder without any bodies, without any forensics, without any autopsies, without any biometrics. And the biometrics, we're now able to determine whether an individual is actually an enemy combatant based upon DNA, fingerprints, and yep. other biometric evidence that connects them to improvised explosive devices, which have been killing yep. Americans. And so we've seen cases where our warriors have been convicted of killing civilians. And then under appeal with the support of United American Patriots, we have investigators go over and say, wait a second, they weren't civilians. These are enemy combatants. And the army doesn't even want to consider it. Like, doesn't matter. We already convicted him. And, you know, he, he violated the rules of engagement. Like, well, no, that's he was found not guilty of violating the rules of engagement. Well, we don't want to take it up. So this is why we're the only organization out here that's fighting for these warriors rights. And if you looked at it from a civilian standpoint, you've got, you know, the, you know, various different organizations, including the Innocence Project, where if they find a civilian is sitting on death row, who's done nothing for our society but bad, has a tremendous rap sheet and is on death row for some horrific crime, yet they find that that individual's rights were somehow violated. They will fight tooth and nail to get that individual off death row and released. And quite frankly, they're right, because there's nothing that any individual in our society can do which is that bad, that heinous, which supersedes all of our rights. That's the one thing that makes sets us apart from all other nations is our individual rights. And yet, for some reason, when it comes to our military, these same organizations will not fight for the rights of these stellar individuals who swore to support and defend our rights. So that's sort of an overview of where we stand and why we continue to fight yeah. for the rights. No, of our I know warriors. what you're saying about the military judicial system. It's a uh... It's an interesting beast, and I haven't been involved personally, and I, I never really got in trouble in the Marine Corps. I never got anything like that, so I didn't. I was never involved on that side. I did. I was called up to be a juror though for a case one time, which was interesting for being a, in a military court and doing the jury duty for that. Um, man, it it is. I knew a I knew a captain. You know, actually, I think he ended up getting out as a major. I knew a major. He was a prior enlisted guy, came over and became an officer, and had popped on a piss test or something. And found. I think he found out his wife was drugging him or something like that. Either way, he got, he got his uh, conviction overturned or he was found not guilty because he went to a court martial for it. And so he was found not guilty, but apparently there's a – uh, another board after that, if you're an officer and they found that he was, right. you know, that that should have ever have a, have occurred in the first place or something. And they still kicked him out, you know, even though they had found him like nothing, you know, in his court trial, like he was good. Like nothing, he didn't do anything wrong, but they still removed him from the service. And, and that honestly, that was Absolutely. like a downward spiral for that guy for a while. And he, I think he's all right now, but I think for like a year or two, it was one of those things where, you know, you're taking away a dude's lifeline. That's like his career. And that's like what he's, you know, he went from enlisted to an officer and now he's a major. So he's been in for a minute, you know, and now you're, I don't know, man, I, I know what you're saying. The military judicial system is kind of whack, you know, like the way, the way some of the stuff goes down. And like, I like what you said about, where you bring up new evidence and you're like, Hey, you know, this is, this isn't how it's supposed to be. Like we should overturn this because here's this evidence and they won't do it because of the PR, you know, like it's going to be a PR black, you know, black eye for them or a nightmare. They're going to have to explain to the press why they're letting someone out of prison. But it's like, 
you know, if the guy didn't do it, the guy didn't do it. You know, who cares what, what your bad day of and, having and to talk to the press is? Like, if he didn't do it, why is he sitting in a jail cell? <laughs> and and then, here's the thing. Even on the best day, when everything's being run the way the Uniform Code of Military Justice should be run, the, the cards are stacked against the individual. However, what's worse is that <clears throat> we're seeing unlawful command influence where the commanders are tipping the scale. We're seeing prosecutorial misconduct where literally prosecutors who, most of these guys, they, they do 18 months to learn how to put on a uniform knife and fork school. And then the next thing you know, unlike our infantry are out there stacking bodies of the enemy, the way they get promoted is by mm -hmm. you know getting convictions. So they're stacking bodies of US servicemen and they will lie, cheat, steal, they will do they will hide evidence and they will work with investigators who will do the same thing. They'll mislead witnesses, they'll coerce testimony, they'll give plea deals to certain individuals so they can get a higher ranking person convicted. And we've seen this time and again where for Clint Lawrence, perfect example. Here's a warrior who the we had an aerostat operator that observed everything that was going on, information was hidden. We had a significant activity report that said this individual was either being set up for an ambush or an attack. They mm -hmm. hid that report. There was evidence showing that he killed enemy combatants and they called them civilians. And the prosecutor, they hid all of this information mm -hmm. and they got their conviction. We have cases where the prosecution has flown in enemy combatants while we're at war. These are Taliban, confirmed Taliban, to testify no against U.S. servicemen. Like, yes, absolutely. We've got the evidence. We have the receipts of how they even took them to SeaWorld. So this is where it's absolutely bizarre what? when you hear the type of They brought cases. Taliban fighters absolutely. here to, to testify against somebody and, and then, and, and, like— and they they used and that and they knew it because they used aliases, they used fake passports. They even said they were uh, government contractors. Flew them in, put them on civilian what? airlines, Delta Airlines, to fly them around with unsuspecting U.S. citizens and had them testify against a United States serviceman. And this is where there has never been a prosecutor in the United States Armed Forces that has ever been criminally held liable for criminal activity. That's crazy. The, it just has never happened. So, so they act with impunity. And that's the problem is that the, the media gets a story. They run with the story. They hear about, oh, look at this horrible mm -hmm. murderer. And it's hard for even U.S. servicemen to say, wait a second. And, and just to put it into perspective, my battalion XO from when I served in the first Gulf War, he was on the board of this organization and he approached me about joining United American Patriots. And Right from the start when he said, look, these are warriors who've been convicted of murder in, in military court martials and are serving in prison and we're fighting for them. I checked out. I said, yeah, I'm not interested. You know, I've got multiple combat tours. None of my Marines have ever committed any war crimes. And now all of a sudden, these guys who are basically, you know, putting a black mark mm -hmm. on our U.S. servicemen, you want me to fight for them? Not interested. Took him three years to get the message across. And when he finally did, and it finally clicked that these warriors' rights were being violated, mm -hmm. that's when I got on board. And I've been on board nearly three years now. And the more I read, the more I learn, the more I go to Leavenworth and I meet with these warriors and I hear their stories, the, the more I, I'm shocked at how you know, corrupt certain elements of the use of the Uniform Code of Military Justice have become. And this is where I, I love my nation. I, I love our country. It's awesome. I love the United States Armed Forces. I absolutely adore all of our warriors. These guys, every single one of them just for, by enlisting is a freaking hero. But there's a cancer. And it's just like my wife had cancer not too long ago. Never stopped loving her. But I was going to do everything I could to make sure that cancer was removed so that she would stay alive and she would go on and be happy and healthy as she is. And the same thing has to happen right now with our armed forces. We have to remove this cancer and we have to make sure that our warriors are protected. Because right now, every time one of our warriors pulls a trigger in combat, depending upon how the enemy mm -hmm. spins the story, they could end up For sitting sure. in a court martial. 
And we've seen this multiple times over. And the enemy knows this. And they know that we're a very sympathetic and empathetic country. And that depending upon who's in charge at the time, whether it's an administration that supports the armed forces and is willing to protect them, or an administration that just assumes negative, that it depends how things are going to play out. And we've seen this uh, in Bob Bale's case, I think is a, a perfect example. And it's an extreme example because Bob Bales confessed to killing 16 civilians, including women and children. And when I met with Bob in prison, you know, I'm not an attorney and, you know, I I just came in and and straight up just asked him warrior to warrior. I was like, Bob, what the hell are you thinking? Killing 16 civilians? He goes, I didn't kill 16 civilians. I'm like, oh, here we go. You know, everybody's got a story. Nobody's guilty, right? My lawyer fucked (laughs) Exactly right. Exactly. And you know what Bob said? He goes, I killed 20. I was like, well, I didn't expect him to up the ante. And he goes, and you want to know something? They weren't all civilians. I went out in town to kill enemy combatants, Taliban, and I did. Now, unfortunately, I did kill civilians and I feel terrible about that. But here's the thing. We've got drone operators and various other attacks that happen that wipe out wedding parties and kill 39 women and children. And all of a sudden, Nothing happens. So what happened in Bob Bale's case? Why was this guy hung out to dry? Well, if you look at the political landscape at the time, you you had a bunch of soldiers at Bagram Air Force Base or Bagram Air Base where they had a detention facility had actually captured some detainees passing notes back and forth in these books. They collected up these books and they burned them. Well, oh, I they all that. happen to be Korans. So next thing you know, exactly, it was, it was, you know, big uproar. You know, the Afghan people went crazy. You know, the whole world, oh, my God, you know, you're, you're destroying Islam and Americans went crazy. How can we do such a thing? And then following right on that, you had some Marine snipers that had hunt, hunted down some enemy combatants that had been killing Marines, ambushing Marines, cutting up their body parts and hanging them from trees. They finally caught them, destroyed them. And then pissed on their dead bodies. Oh, my God. How could Americans do such a horrible thing, pissing on dead bodies? Like, this was, you know, tremendous uproar. Now, while this is going on, the Obama administration is working to try and close the strategic partnership agreement with Afghanistan to try and come to some ending there. And the status of forces agreement, which talks about how do we actually handle criminal activity by our armed forces? So all of these negotiations are going on, and then boom, you've got this case where the Afghan people claim Bob Bales kills 16 civilians. Well, one of the commanders in that AOR, the same day, goes down to observe what happened and to see the bodies. Mm -hmm. Never sees the bodies. As a matter of fact, the Afghan CID went down to see the bodies. They got into a gunfight. One of the Afghans got killed trying to oh, come really? in to see what was going on. They never saw the bodies. So nobody saw the bodies. There was no autopsies. There were no forensics. There was no biometrics to see if Bob had actually killed enemy combatants. The story came out and the story stuck. And within a week, you had President Obama come out and say to the military, prosecute this case aggressively, not investigate prosecute. So he, the die was already set. Then you had Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta come out and say, the death mm. penalty is on the table. So now the prosecution is saying, we're going to kill you, Bob. And Bob's sitting here like, well, wait a second. Does anybody want to hear my side of the story? And they didn't. And not only did you know our leadership in our nation, but the media had spread the story. So the whole nation hated this horrible murderer And Bob's sitting here with the prosecution saying they're going to kill him. And his wife is saying, Bob, I love you. Please do whatever they say to do. Just stay alive. His defense attorney, his whole objective was to make sure that Bob was not killed. So they signed a a declaration of, of stipulation of facts. And I've talked to Bob about this. He goes, yeah, some of this stuff is true and some of it's not. But even in the stipulation of facts, the prosecution, even, you know, they signed off on this. Bob claims he killed 20. So where's the other four? Well, we don't know. And we don't know where any of the 16 are. And so Bob may have been, you know, done some horrible acts or 
He may have done some things and the Taliban may have come in yeah. to make it look worse. We have no idea. We know that the witnesses claimed that there was multiple people that came into the village and started killing people. And the prosecutor even said, yeah, we, we had to convince them that they were wrong. Wait a second. Why is the prosecution convincing witnesses they're wrong? So Bob ended up taking this plea deal and Afghan Taliban came in to testify That's crazy. at his sentencing. And he's sitting in prison right now. And, you know, so look, was Bob crazy? Maybe. We know he took methylquin. We know the U.S. Army pulled methylquin from uh, U.S. soldiers right after this incident. We know that Army Special Forces had problems way back in 2002 when I was in Afghanistan. And they were issuing methylquin. It was called Larium. That was the label on it. Uh, Anti-malaria drug. These three special operators, high-ranking first sergeants and mass sergeants, go back home and kill their wives and two of them kill themselves. And nobody could explain it other than this drug. And so this nobody acknowledged that, hey, maybe Bob was freaking crazy. And this is where, you know, even if he had the right intent to go kill enemy, like stepping off mm -hmm. base by himself to go hunt them down, I'll tell you, yeah. that's a little crazy. And if a U.S. citizen goes into a school here in America and guns down a bunch of children, the first thing people think is that dude's crazy and they're going to identify whether or not he is able to actually stand trial for murder because we don't put crazy people away for murder. We put them away in a psychiatric hospital and we treat them for their issues. But Bob never had that chance. He never had that right. And so there's a lot of really concerning issues dealing with Bob's case, but nobody can get over the, the narrative that's out there saying, well, he confessed to killing yeah, 16 civilians. Tough. And so this is one of the cases we're elevating. Exactly. So we're elevating this case for the president to take a look at. And uh, again, if you're going to release 150 death row inmates, Taliban murderers, then why is Bob still sitting in prison? That, you know, those guys never served more than 18 years. And so now you're going to have Bob sitting there for life. It, there's just if you want to have justice yeah. then it has no, to that's be that's a just. really interesting um i actually remember that case you know i'm reading through the uh the uh information sheet that you sent over to me i actually remember that when it was on the news and i remember them talking about him walking off base and killing these people and i'm like dude must have snapped you know because that's obviously not just a normal thing to yeah. do and the fact that he was even able to get off base without anybody stopping him or anything is kind of a interesting thing too would you be would you be would you be satisfied with like uh with if they decided to like retry the case rather than just do a pardon, you know something like oh, absolutely. that? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I, I would I would be happy if they tried the case. Mm. They never tried it. That was the problem. There was never due process. I would love for the U.S. government to present evidence. They had no evidence, and they they were talking about well, I should say no hard evidence. They the. The prosecutor even went to uh, Emory Law School and was talking to future law students. And he was talking about, you know, we, we found this pile of brass because they didn't go in mm -hmm. until three weeks after. And it was a bunch of brass. And he even admits, he goes, we don't know where that brass came from, whether it came from this building, that building, this village, that bit. it may have come mm -hmm. from a completely different village. But there was just a pile of brass. So the, the crime scene yeah. was never preserved. And when they went there, it was absolutely cleaned out. And again. No U.S. personnel ever saw any body. As a matter of fact, no ISAF personnel, you know, International Security Assistance Force, no one ever saw any dead civilian or Taliban. And this is, and I would say Bob would probably plead not guilty by reason of insanity, or he should, but uh, it, the case certainly, it, it violates all of our rights. Yeah. And when some individual like this that had four combat tours, highly respected staff NCO, TBI, PTSD, had actually gone, had been uh, involved in 10 IED attacks. I mean, so this is a guy that, you know, when you have TBI and P PTSD and you You're were given methylquin, it, look, there's, plus, you know, there, he had a lot of personal challenges and all the rest, but, at the end of the day, we still have to give everyone the benefit of their rights. For sure, you know, like we can't just we can't dismiss them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I think um, first off, the the first time I heard of your organization was when I had Fred Galvin on. You know, and he came on and talked sure. about it, and he brought up you guys, great warrior, 
Yeah, it, superstar. For, and that's a that's a perfect example of of a group of of Marines that did what they were supposed to do and executed their mission, you know, extremely well. You know, showed their profi- yep. proficiency as they were trained, and and then rather than like listen to them, they like you said, they took the the enemy fighters. Uh, propaganda bullshit that they put out as the gospel and didn't investigate properly again, you know, saying that they'd killed all these civilians and stuff when that hadn't occurred. So this isn't, I mean, there's precedent for sure for this kind of thing to happen. And it's, I mean, honestly, it's kind of disheartening for me. It's not as much, it sucks as a veteran. It sucks obviously to hear something like this, but I can't imagine someone that's in right now listening to this and thinking like, man, like what, what what's going to happen to me, you know, if I get sent overseas and stuff and something happens. And um, let, let me give you let, I'll tell you what happens, because they talk about when all of a sudden you pardon a warrior. Well, that's undermining good order and discipline. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. It's the exact opposite. Justice must be served. And our warriors have to know that when they pull the trigger, that they will go through a process that is just doesn't mean that they'll be found guilty or not guilty. It just means it will be just. And you had Clint Lawrence's case where he ordered his soldiers to engage uh, three Taliban on a motorcycle. We know now that they were Taliban. At the time, they claimed they were civilians. And he ended up getting charged with murder and was put away for life in Leavenworth. Well, not long after there, there was an Air Force security patrol outside Bagram Air Force Base. A motorcycle started coming towards their their patrol, and what did they do? Well, they, they were very much aware of what happened to Clint Lawrence, so they did not engage. Even though the rules of engagement mm-hmm. allowed them to, they chose not to. They're all dead right now. So that's the problem. When our warriors are not afforded their rights, when they're assumed to be guilty, when all of a sudden other people know about this, you're now impacting the combat efficiency and effectiveness of other warriors. And that that's, what's most detrimental about all of this. You know, I actually saw when I was in Afghanistan in 2011 with three, six, I was the, um, I was the fires chief. So I worked in the operations center most of the time. And, um, I remember one day there was a foot patrol out and, you know, not very often are you on a foot patrol and you run into an IED in place or something like that. Those dudes are really good about getting it, getting the IED in and getting out of there before anyone really sees them. And right. um, I guess we had some idiot Taliban dude or some dude who just wasn't paying attention was in placing an IED as a foot patrol basically walked up on him. <laughs> and he tried to like grab his shit and start to flee. And I think the point man took him out, you know. And uh, sure. so we got radioed back, like, hey, we, we, you know, took contact, blah, blah, blah. This is what happened. And one of the officers in the command center was like, hey, are we sure that was a good shooting? And the three alpha, who um, I can't remember his name, but he, he fucking immediately was like, what the fuck did you say? He's like, don't fucking, he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, and, and so what happened was this dude, like, was, is that a good shooting? Like, should we start an investigation? And, and he turned and was like, what are you talking about? And like, if you're going to talk like that one, don't talk about it in the command center where everyone's at, like that should be behind private doors discussion because all you're doing now is sowing doubt in everybody's mind that now if they pull the trigger, there could possibly be an investigation. Even when it's a clear exactly. cut situation, like this dude is putting in an IED, like we're literally watching you do it. And, um, I remember seeing that and thinking like, man, like why, like, I can't believe he even asked that question. Like, should there be an investigation? Like, what are you talking about? Like the investigation and, was the patrol walked up and saw this dude putting in an IED that, you know, sorry, bro. That's the rules of this game that we're in called war. And, and you know, it's interesting because prosecutors, they talk about, well, we have to have the rule of law and that's not correct. Because our warriors don't fall under the rule of law. They fall under the laws of armed conflict. And so it's a very different situation. And they are they are supposed to be given the presumption of innocence. Because decisions in the heat of battle and in stressful environments like that, they have to give these warriors the presumption of innocence because it's a, it's a messy job. It's a dangerous job. And so a lot of people, they think of it as, well, you know, it's, they're sort of like police officers. No, they're not. And this is the big difference. Police officers, for the most part, 
And of course, we've seen recent examples which have changed this narrative a little bit. But for the most part, if if they engage a criminal, criminals are not trying to kill police officers. They're trying to commit Mm -hmm. crimes and get away. That's very different from an enemy combatant who's engaged with a U.S. Marine or a soldier because their job is to kill the Marine or the soldier. And so the police officer may have the choice of whether or not to shoot. The warrior doesn't necessarily have that ability and should, even on the off chance, decide, well, it's not a justifiable shot, that that should be sort of a minimal perspective as opposed to you have the right to save your own life and Mm -hmm. the lives of your fellow warriors. And so it's a, it's a very tough situation when all of a sudden our leadership is second guessing all the way down and assuming that something's bad as opposed to, look, if you've trained your warriors properly, then you should assume they've done everything right. And if I find evidence otherwise, okay, well, we'll address that. But I'm going to go in with the assumption that my warriors located sure. close with destroyed the enemy. Not that they did it. Yeah. They did some it's a sick fine crime. line, I think. I understand. I understand somewhat, you know, the higher commands and the upper echelons of the federal government wanting to make sure that, you know, what we're doing is the right thing. Because if you don't, you end up with these, like, I mean, if you look just recently in the last couple of weeks, the whole SAS thing coming out, how they were just killing civilians and stuff like that. Well, were they? We, we don't know. But that's the thing. The narrative has already come out that they have been. So we don't know all of the story yet. We know one side and it hasn't right. fully been investigated. And so there still is a lot of information, but, but you're right. The narrative has already come out and there's the presumption of guilt and China is having conflicts with Australia because of all of this. And it's, it's again, might they have done something wrong? Maybe. Uh, From what I've read on that case though, it sounds like they're admitting that they did it. Like it sounds like they've already, the people that were involved had admitted to it. But I guess in this case, Robert Bales admitted to, you know, doing what he did and it necessarily wasn't true. So you know, it's just one of those things. It's like, who do you believe? You know, at what point do we... Right. Well, well, it's another good point. Who do you believe? So here's an interesting situation. Staff Sergeant Calvin Gibbs, he's sitting in prison right now. The He came in, took over a unit and, that was having a lot of disciplinary problems. The uh, squad leader before him had been taken out. And so he came in to replace them. And as he's still trying to figure out what's happening in the unit... Some soldiers decided to go and, you know, they hadn't gotten their kills yet. You know, they wanted to, you know, prove that they were warriors. So they had to get some kills. And whereas Gibbs, you know, Staff Sergeant, he'd actually been engaged in multiple conflicts and or combat engagements prior. And they decided, well, they were going to go k- kill civilians and then put drop weapons on them and then take photographs and say, look, you know, we kill bad guys. And what ended up happening was they were also smoking pot or hash at the time. And an investigation went down into them doing drugs. And Staff Sergeant Gibbs, you know, he wasn't aware of this and he didn't have any concerns with the investigation because he knew he wasn't going to pop positive. He didn't do any drugs. You know, he was a little bit more mature. He spent more time working out, reading and all the rest. And what ended up happening was these guys realized they were going to get busted and they actually confessed to murdering civilians. And they then were like, hey, why don't you take some time and think about it? The investigators allowed these guys who confessed to murder to actually go on Kandahar Air Force Base. They stole a truck and started driving around smoking pot, colluding. So these these guys were doing drugs that admitted to murder, started colluding, and they said, well, you know what? That Staff Sergeant Gibbs, he was the one that told us to do this. So the next thing you know, the investigators called Gibbs in, and they say, hey, you know, we want to talk to you about murder and, you know, your involvement. Gibbs is like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I want an attorney. So what do they do? The first thing they do is they lock him in a cave. They put him in pretrial confinement while these other guys that actually had admitted to murder, they they bought him lunch. They allowed him to use the phone. They gave him all sorts of preferential treatment so that they could make sure they had their story straight. They put him in a cave? Against Gibbs. And what's interesting, yeah, they held him in a cave and then they, 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 they shackled him and they, they treated him like a convict before anything went forward. And then what ends up happening is that they the evidence showed that uh, they actually convicted Gibbs of three murders. Gibbs was not present for two of them. That evidence came out. He wasn't even there when two of those murders occurred. The third alleged murder, 
The witness who was with Gibbs at the time said they turned the corner, an enemy combatant engaged them, and this other guy, Wagnon was his name, he engaged first, and then Gibbs engaged, and it was a justifiable kill. But what ended up happening was that individual, that soldier, Wagnon, a highly respected warrior, they charged him with murder, and they wouldn't allow him to testify. So this other individual, the drug addict who had actually committed murder, admitted to committing murder, he claimed, well, I was there and I saw it happen and I saw Gibbs kill the civilian and drop a weapon on him, which there was no counter evidence to this because that one individual that saw it, who would have also testified that this individual named Morlock mm. was not there. So they ran with this case and they convicted Gibbs, again, wasn't present for two and was actually acting appropriately, consistent with the rules of engagement for the third, he's sitting in prison now for life. Morlock, the guy who admitted to committing murder, is in for 24 years. You've got two other guys, seven years, three years, lesser sentences, because what happens is the prosecution, they're like, oh, let's get the staff sergeant and let's let's get these other guys to cop pleas. We'll give them lesser sentences. And then when we get this other guy yeah. and put him away for life. And, you know, Gibbs and quite frankly, you know, in in all fairness, Gibbs had done some messed up things earlier and uh, Gibbs had actually he had dismembered a dead body. Oh. He actually uh, took off a finger or two of some dead Taliban. And so the prosecution used that and said, look, this guy's a psycho. You know, he cuts off fingers. So obviously he's a murderer. And unfortunately, that's not the way the world works or it's not supposed to work. Bad people don't necessarily do horrible things. They can make mistakes and still not be murderers. And here's the thing. Bob has admitted to doing, or I'm sorry, Calvin's admitted to doing things wrong. And if we want to hold Calvin accountable, great. But we don't put people away for life for dismembering a dead body. And so you want to hold him accountable for that? Great. Put him in for 13 years, which is twice, three times longer than anybody who's ever done a similar crime. But Let's get rid of this murder sentence, which it's yeah. just simply not appropriate. No, I, I I can see that. I can agree with that. That's uh, I mean, you got me on this, man. Mm -hmm. Like, um, <laughs> you don't have to convince me with some of these. I just <laughs> the things that you're bringing up, the the steps that a prosecution will take to win a case is kind of mind blowing. And I thought that was, I think Fred Galvin did a really good job of kind of talking through some of that when he was explaining how. They were trying to make certain evidence classified so that people couldn't see it. They were having closed door hearings so that the press could only come in during certain parts of the trial, which were all the negative parts against him and his men and none of the, you know, like character witnesses and stuff that's for their side. Yeah. All the, the exonerated they only allowed the press exactly. to see the bad stuff. And it's like, they're, you know, I mean, you got to hand it to them. I guess they're playing the prosecutor game. Like, I don't know. They're, they're hitting all these different facets by winning the PR war and by, you know, only presenting evidence like as they would, would want to. I don't know. It's just, um, I think. So, but here's, here's a perfect example of another warrior. We're fighting to get a pardon right now. We actually were able to just get him paroled just recently. First Sergeant John Hatley. This guy, by many accounts, has, has hundreds of combat engagements. He's, this is the type of first sergeant that you would definitely want in your command. He wouldn't sit back in the rear shuffling paperwork. He was out there with his troops leading the attack time and time again. And what ended up happening was he actually was coming after another individual to hold him accountable for crimes that he did. And this guy goes, oh, well, wait a second. You know, the first sergeant, he murdered four detainees. And so immediately... CID, prosecutors, everybody, all right, let's go after this highly decorated, highly respected first sergeant, and let's nail him to the wall. So what do they do? They actually go to the farm where supposedly this these murders of four detainees happen and ask this farmer about the incidents that happened on his farm at that night. He says, mm -hmm. nothing happened on my farm. He goes, well, m maybe you didn't know about it. No, I, I would know. <laughs> Nobody would have come here without me knowing like, well, would you mind if we just went and investigated the alleged location that this occurred? Please. So they go out there and they conduct all their forensics. They look for blood splatter, shell casings, bullets, clothing, bone fragments, something. They couldn't find anything. Well, they allegedly they had kicked the bodies into this canal. 
So CID puts a scuba team, seven-man scuba team, into the canal to dredge it, to find the bodies, to find casings, bullets, again, clothing, bone fragments, something, nothing. They couldn't find one shred of hard evidence. Well, that wasn't going to deter them because they knew the village that allegedly these four came from. So they went to the village and they said, can you tell us about the four people who were, who were murdered from your village? Nobody was murdered. Well, is anybody missing? Nobody's missing. They're like, listen, we have salacia payments here. We want to give money to you if you just tell us who it was that was killed. Nobody was killed. And yet this first sergeant was still found guilty of murder, four counts of murder, and was put away for life. Now, how did this happen? Well, they ended up coercing junior enlisted soldiers to testify against the first sergeant. And one of the ways they did that was they had a test, they had a statement from the first sergeant signed by the first sergeant saying that these troops were the ones that actually pulled the trigger. The problem was the first sergeant didn't write that. And it wasn't the first sergeant's signature. It was all forged. It was all made up. And they coerced these junior enlisted guys into testifying. And what? based purely on this testimony, with no forensics, no hard evidence, nothing, they put first sergeant Hatley away for life. Now, fortunately, with the support of the Justice for Warrior Caucus, a group of congressmen that are fighting for our warriors, uh, and myself, I was able to testify at his parole hearing. We were able to get him paroled. And he, he's home now, he's married, he's got a kid, he's got a great life, but he still needs to get pardoned. Or we want the, the, the findings and the sentence of his case to be totally wiped out, which the president of the United States has the authority to do as the mm -hmm. ultimate convening authority so that he could get all of his back pay and could get reinstated and go about his yeah. life without the stigma hanging thing. over That's his something, head. Something else I talked with Fred Galvin about how that stigma – you know, ruin these dudes' lives for seven or eight years or almost, you know, almost a decade as they had to deal Absolutely. with this. And it still does because still it's like people are still like, oh, sure, you're not guilty, right? You know, like kind of kind of deal. Exactly. And and that's and it's interesting because the presumption is, oh, well, you, you mm -hmm. played some sort of game to, uh, you know, avoid that stigma or to, to have this overturned. But it's quite the opposite that the prosecutors play the game to prosecute these people. And this is where a lot of people came out when we had our warriors pardoned. They they went on the attack that, you know, again, President Trump, he's undermining good order and discipline. Not at all. He's reinforcing our judicial system. He's reinforcing the fact that our warriors who go in harm's way on our behalf, who voluntarily swore to support and defend our rights, our constitution, that they have sure. their rights preserved. And we're hoping that the president so will how, continue in, to do in that. In the case of Hatley, how if there was no body, I mean, how did that even like begin? How did that how did that investigation even start if there was no anything? You know, because Hat, because Hatley brought charges against another individual who is doing some really heinous things. It wasn't murder, but it was he uh, he actually was using corporal punishment on his junior troops. He would beat them up. Uh, he was basically coercing junior and uh, female enlisted into having sex with him and threatening them with sending pornographic photographs back home. And uh, he actually threatened a new second lieutenant who came into the combat zone and said, basically, you know, you do what I tell you to do or I'm going to frag you. And uh, when First Sergeant Hatley heard about this, he said, hell no. And he decides to bring charges against that individual. And this individual said, well, wait a second. I got something bigger and better than that. Hatley's a murderer. So that's how it all started. And again, without the presumption of innocence, they had the presumption of guilt. And they There's said, like we're going to nail evidence. this guy. It's crazy. They put none. No, there was absolutely no hard evidence, not one piece of hard evidence. Man, it makes me feel like, like I definitely don't, I'm glad I never got involved with the military justice system. You know what I'm saying? Like it just doesn't, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and honestly seeing, Having been having sat on a jury, it was a sexual assault case. Having sat on a military jury and watching it, the whole thing happen. That's my only time I've ever been in, in a courtroom and involved in a case like that. Um, I'll be honest, I was not impressed with the lawyers that were acting as the prosecution, and um, and I know that those lawyers, you know, they flip around between being prosecutors and defense depending on what part of their career and stuff they're in. 
but I was sitting there watching and I'm like, man, this is, if my life was hanging on the, on the back of one of these two people that I'm watching talk, I would feel really bad about this because they are not very good at what they're doing. And the, you're no, talking no, no, about no, no, the no, no. I'm talking about the prosecution because, and I only say that because I know that at some point they will be defense attorneys within the military justice system. The actual defense, he went out and got a civilian attorney, which was probably the smartest thing he could have done. Right. Um, and he ended up actually, Absolutely. he actually ended up it's being, mandatory. we, we ended up finding him not guilty, you know, of the charges that they had charged him with too, because the prosecution's defense like completely fell apart. Like they, they brought in a guy, they flew in a guy to come in and tell us a story about what he saw happen. And when he put him on the stand, the guy's like, I don't remember seeing anything, <laughs> you know, and you could just see the prosecution's face. Like what, like the, you were, you were our dude, you were supposed to be, this was the, this was it. And he came in and just like destroyed their case. So we found the guy not guilty, but just seeing that whole thing, I was like, this is fucking crazy, man. Like, I mean, <laughs> so let me get, let me give you another example of prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, First Lieutenant Michael Behenna, he was a soldier who uh, President Trump did pardon, and uh, he was convicted of murder. And leading up to his trial, the prosecution went out and got a forensic expert. And what was interesting is, unlike most of these cases, they actually had the body. And he conducted autopsies on this body. And he came back to the prosecution and said, listen, Michael Behenna said that he acted in self-defense that the enemy combatant, who was a detainee at the time, lunged for him to take his weapon, and Behenna acted in self-defense and killed him. Well, the prosecution fired that expert, and they buried that report. So it never came out in trial. And Behenna was, he ended up getting convicted of murder. Now, under appeal, they wouldn't even consider it because they said, well, you know, he shouldn't have been interrogating that individual anyway, and so he no longer had the right Mm to self-defense, yeah. which is absolutely insane. Our warriors always have the right to self-defense. And so it had to go to a pardon where the president actually reviewed the facts and the evidence and all the rest and ended up pardoning Michael Behenna. And But these are the challenges that if you don't have our senior leadership, and I mean at, at the civilians, uh, like the president, willing to go to bat and willing to take the adverse media that's exactly uh, what it is. That too, yeah. that comes with this, it, it, that, you know, you need someone who's going to say, look, the whole reason, and, and I was fortunate enough to meet the president when we actually introduced him to, uh, to the warriors that he had pardoned. And the president asked a very, you know, insightful question. He said, you know, I'm getting a lot of pushback from my generals, from the media, from just about everybody for pardoning these individuals. I just want to know, am I doing the right thing? And the response we gave was, sir, you're the only elected individual in the whole United States Armed Forces. It's your job to preserve the individual's rights. If if you're not able to do that, Mm -hmm. nobody else will because the organization is institutionalized. And what ends up happening is most leaders, they, they don't get extra credit for letting, pushing away a, a court martial because then they'll be perceived as, oh, well, they're too lenient, you know, not willing to be that hard commander. And so what ends up happening is when the commander's not really sure, they, they say, well, let's just let it go to court martial. We'll just have the judicial system play out, which again, you're, you're now pretty much sentencing, sentencing these guys to be, being found guilty. And we have a perfect case right now with uh, three MARSOC special operators, two Raiders and a special operations independent duty corpsman, two gunnery sergeants, gunnery sergeant Danny Dreyer, gunnery sergeant Josh Negron, and chief Eric Gilman. And these guys, exceptional careers. Like you don't get to be playing at that level of a special operator where, you know, you've enlisted, you've gone and served at, in, you know, the gunnery sergeant's tours as enlisted Marines, then went on to become reconnaissance Marines, force reconnaissance Marines, and now Raiders. Like these are some of the best of the best who've gone through the, the most challenging yeah. screening you could imagine. And what ends up happening is while they're in Erbil, Iraq, a, an intoxicated civilian contractor picks a fight with these guys and they act to defuse it as best as possible in every possible way, trying to stop this incident from escalating. And the contractor 
hits one of the gunnery sergeants twice in the face, and the other gunnery sergeant, to stop this assault, hits the contractor once. The one punch, he goes down, he's out. The other, all the contractor's buddies, they take off. They leave, letting this contractor lay in the streets of Erbil, Iraq. And these three special operators, because of their integrity and their, their desire to serve, they said, all right, whether or not this guy was intoxicated and he attacked us is irrelevant. Like, we're not going to allow a United States citizen to lay here in the streets. So they pick him up. They bring him back. They care for him. And people say, well, why didn't they have some senior medical person look at him? They did. Special Operations Independent Duty Corpsman Gilman was the most senior medical professional there. He checked his vitals. Everything was fine. Everything was looking good. They were going to let him sleep it off. And what ends up happening is in the middle of the night, he starts having distressed breathing. They try and do heroic life-saving measures. He ends up getting sent to Lambstool, Germany. Four, four days later, unfortunately, he dies. He had asphyxiated. He actually threw up, and then he mm. swallowed his own vomit into his lungs, and he died. Horrible, horrible situation. Well, the command, again, quickly, the assumption of guilt. They accuse these three top-rated warriors of boot-stomping this individual. The three of them beat him up, and they did these horrific things. The, you know, it was a drunken murder. That was the term that was used. It went back to the command and everybody starts, you know, going crazy. And of course, the assumption of guilt plays in like, hey, we can't have special operators acting like cowboys and just doing crazy stuff like this, which is a horrible prejudice against our most highly trained and disciplined warriors. But it's, it comes out of jealousy, of course. But what ends up happening is they take these warriors' security clearances, which means they can no longer mm -hmm. operate within the command. They can no longer go on operations. They're given petty jobs, like you know, ha handing out towels at the gym and cleaning up freaking messes in the, the the hospital and and giving out keys to the the barracks. I mean, these are <laughs> we put millions of dollars into training these guys. They're mm -hmm. now pushed off to the side. Now, why is this really bad? Because the command, remember, they're going to select the jury and the jury's going to come from that pool of warriors that, well, they already see those guys are guilty. If they weren't guilty, why aren't they still operating with us? So the presumption of guilt is there. So before these guys even go to trial, there's already a presumption of guilt and there's already been influence to say, hey, you know, don't interact with those guys and you don't, you know, don't testify on behalf of those guys. And so they've been alienated and they've been charged with manslaughter. And it's what's really horrible about this whole thing. It was all caught on surveillance camera. We have video of this whole incident and it shows right from the beginning, early on, this contractor is inebriated. He picks fights with other people, picked a fight with Eric Gilman. Security escorted him out. He went outside with his seven buddies and they waited for the Marsoc three security said, Hey, don't go outside. Let them cool down. When they walked off, the three left. Gunnery Sergeant Dreher, not even realizing the severity of the situation, goes over and with his hands down by his side, he's like, hey, look, can, can we all get along? Yeah. You know, we're all out here together. We've got a real enemy. Let's stop fighting. He does exactly what a gunnery sergeant is supposed to do. Address an issue, de-escalate, get everybody working together again. Well, this contractor pokes Danny. Danny doesn't respond. He then lunges at Danny. Danny pushes him back to protect himself. And then he hits Danny twice in the face. All of this is on surveillance camera. But when all of a sudden it was brought to the convening authority and they said, hey, th th you don't have a case. Like even the, the judge presiding over the Article 32 hearing says, look, it looks like self-defense, defense of others. I, you know, the prosecution is going to have a real hard time trying to prosecute this. They still decided to go forward because, well, if the commander wiped it away. It would be looked at, well, he's not tough on yeah. discipline in his units. So he, this is another case we're trying to get wiped out. We call them the Marsoc Three. As a matter of fact, I'm wearing a hat that they put together with one of their em emblems here with Lady Justice <laughs> carrying an M4. And, uh, you know, we're, we're fighting for these I actually three, remember the hearing about that one in the well. news as well, you know, and it's another one of those, what's going on with Special Operations Command, blah, blah, blah. Like, like it's, uh, so, exactly. I, I, you know, I brought it up multiple times on my Facebook page, and I think I've talked about it on the podcast before. I'm a journalism student, you know, I'm a journalism advertising student at San Diego State. And I think something that I've been kind of aware of 
prior to being in school, but school kind of gives you that formalized version of it, is the whole thing of media framing and the salience issue. And if people don't know what I'm talking about, just Google like media framing and salience. And all that is is how the media as a group chooses to cover a story. And if they only choose to cover one portion of it, then that's all you're getting, and then that's how your opinion is swayed like you're saying, you already have a negative opinion before you even hear about the entire case or the entire, all of the facts. It's, um, it's a real issue. And that's what, and, and now, and now most people, mm -hmm. they don't even read the article. So even if they, they give the other side, the headlines yeah. pretty much is what people read. That's what they take away. Maybe the first paragraph, but for the most part, people they don't scroll make it to through the and they're like, Oh, yeah, they don't make it down to the eighth operators. paragraph where they give you the actual information <laughs> that you want. Exactly. And that's, that's an issue that's that's and, an and ongoing it, issue in the media right now and I think I think a lot of Americans through the this whole tumultuous like election cycle that we've just gone through have realized you know that I can't trust the media to tell me the true story you know what I'm saying and that's on left left or right true. you know what I'm saying like I think a lot of people have come to the conclusion and have finally realized that I need to find multiple sources for any kind of story you know that comes out most reasonable people at least you know because we're just getting a bunch of garbage yeah. and you hear and stuff tough. like this where I know what you're talking about. I know this case actually, because I've heard, I've read multiple articles on it and none of them, you know, they all paint a, a pretty bad picture for the, the three dudes that it was some kind of drunken fight. Yeah. That turned into a dude dying and stuff like that. You know, they don't talk about, they don't talk about them exactly. giving the, the and medical the care takeaway. and stuff like that afterwards. No, and, and nor do they talk about the fact that, Drunken fight. It, it yeah. wasn't a fight. It, 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 there was there was one punch that was thrown by one gunnery sergeant, which ended it. Which interestingly, the other they, they tackled him afterwards, and they wanted to continue to turn this into a brawl. And on the video, you see gunnery sergeant Josh Negron stand up and hug the guy and go, "Hey, dude, dude, we got no fight here. I was just trying to stop him from beating up my buddy. But there's no fight, mm -hmm. and this is all on video. It's not like yeah. he said, she said. It's this is there. It's That's indisputable crazy, evidence. In some of these other cases you've talked about, you know, the prosecution hiding evidence and stuff like that. That's obviously illegal. You know, they have to come forward with any kind of, well, it's absolutely you know, illegal. any kind of, uh, retribution or any kind of like charges against these prosecutors that are handling these cases badly. Like what's the, <laughs> what's the, do, do, to, to, the, to my knowledge, there has not been one prosecutor that has ever been held criminally liable for criminal violations of the Constitution. Not one. And, and here's a most recent one, which people may be aware of. In mm -hmm. Chief Eddie Gallagher's case, the prosecution actually put spyware on the email yeah. so that they could spy on the attorney client privilege. Huge thing. This, that's a major violation of constitutional rights. And what happened to that attorney? They administratively moved him off the case. Well, when is he when is he going to court? When are the charges going to be preferred yeah. against him? Never. And so here's the thing. If you're a prosecutor, then you could lean forward as much as you want. You could take as much risk as you want because there really isn't any risk. The worst thing that'll happen is, well, you'll be administratively, administratively moved off. But the reward is if you win this case, there, especially wow. that case. Absolutely. You're setting yourself up either for promotion within the military or to transition out and getting a big high paid job as an attorney out in the civilian world. You know, why yeah. not take that chance? And that's where they, they have to be held accountable. That, coming out about them doing that, that um, using the email, like tracking their email, like, you know, uh, using the, the gathering information to illegal light. I mean, they're spying on them. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. And that Absolutely. honestly, prior to that, I was like, dude, like this Eddie Gallagher guy, like, I mean, y y people are saying, yay, we sent him over there to do these things and, you know, they do what they got to do. Like he might've taken it way too far. You know, he, you know, posing pictures with dead bodies and shit. I'm not into that. That's not my thing. But when that came out, I'm like, man, I, now I don't have faith in anything I'm hearing. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're telling me that the, the prosecution <laughs> is, is sending out viral or viruses and emails so that they can track information on the people that they're prosecuting. Like that is crazy. And I don't, I can't believe that guy's not being, it I mean, is, that is, that is a huge deal right there. That is a huge deal to spy on another. And, and we see and stuff. it. We see this 
time and again, uh, over and over, we see situations like this that, you know, it it's disturbing and th- there's no real oversight. It's all internal. And, you know, going back to Clint Lawrence's case, when Clint Lawrence uh, was his case was still under appeal. You had an army general going out. I think it was the 50th anniversary of the My Lai incident. You know, this is Callie's incident where he, you know, he was convicted of killing 116 civilians. And he equated Callie to Clint Lawrence, who, again, he, he didn't even see the enemy. He just told his, his soldiers to actually engage these three Taliban on a motorcycle. And he said, you know, look, he was a bad apple. Now, this guy, he was the senior general overseeing the whole appellate process. So think about it. If your boss is telling you this guy, Clint Lawrence, is a bad apple and he committed this horrible war crime and you're reviewing his case for appeal, you're not going to put your career on the line because yeah. you're not going to go against your boss. you be like, oh, boss already said he was guilty. So they never allowed any of this information to go in. And where it gets worse is that when we brought this to members of Congress, they were like, this is appalling. We have to look into this. this is, we're we're going to bring this to the president of the United States. And we said, thank you very much. And this one congressman, he said, he was insightful. He says, let's do our due diligence because, you know, these guys at UAP and the attorneys, you know, they seem like they're credible, but, yeah. you know, trust but verify. So they called the JAG, uh, Judge Advocate General of the Army to brief the congressman. The Judge Advocate General comes in and says, sir, you don't want to get behind this case. He's a bad apple. This guy, he violated the rules of engagement. This is not the type of case that you want to support. And the congressman backed off and they went silent for a while. And when we followed up to say, you know, what's going on? They said, look, you, you set our congressman up for failure. You were about to freaking embarrass our congressman in front of the president of the United States. We're like, well, what are you talking about? Like, well, you said that he was found not guilty of changing and violating the rules of engagement. I said, that's a fact. We're like, well, where is that? And we showed him. And he says, are you telling us that the judge advocate general of the United States Army is lying to a United States congressman? I said, we're not telling you that. Yeah. You just like, told me that. Know. So I don't know what he said. But exactly. So that's the problem is that they circle the wagons. They protect themselves as opposed to being able to. The appellate process is supposed to go back and say, hold on a second. Some information was not addressed. Some rights were violated. Let's mm-hmm. take another look at this. But they, they don't. And they just keep moving forward. And this is the problem with all of these what's called crimes in combat or the the more popular term is these war crime cases. And uh, again, this is where UAP, we step in and say, look, we're, we're going to give these guys a shot. We're going to preserve their rights. If they're found guilty and you've done it lawfully and you preserve their rights, so be it. But they have to have their rights preserved. These lawyers that are like the military prosecutors and defense attorneys, are they? do they fall under the American Bar Association while they're military uh, legal counsel? That's a good question. I, I don't know the answer like, to that. Like I should. A lot of these, um, you know, like you were saying, these prosecutorial like missteps that they are doing, like these like basically crimes that they're committing, would be investigated by the ABA because yep. they're pretty. I mean, they're pretty strict when they're when they talk about like lawyers fucking something up. You know, they don't take that very kindly. But I don't know how that works in the federal system because normally that's like a state. I think that's a state issue. So I might have to look. Right. And, and what we, well, it's interesting because the, the military mm-hmm. tends to be a closed system. And what we've had to do is if the, in, in the civilian sector, you can go through the appeals process and you can even bring it to the Supreme Court. In the military, if the appeals court shoots it down, mm. it doesn't go forward. So it can never actually get to the Supreme Court to address whether or not an individual's rights are violated. So what we, United American Patriots, have supported is attorneys taking these cases outside of this closed sure. military system and bringing them into federal courts. And these are called we, filing writs of habeas corpus, which now you get this outside entity that's not beholden to the military, that has doesn't have to worry about their career being jeopardized, that they're not falling in line with mm-hmm. what the convening authority wants. They're taking another look at it. And so this is where we try and bring these cases out to ch- get a review. And we, we have a couple of these cases for uh, Lawrence and Bales and others that are being reviewed right now. And, and it remains to be seen at how they'll all play out. But as we've seen, yeah. just because something goes to the court, 
doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to rule so would you, it should. Uh, what would your organization like to see? Would they like to see kind of more civilian, you know, oversight of the UCMJ and the, and the military court systems? Or, you know, like, do you guys have any kind of ideas on that, on actually changing the system rather than fighting every every time an issue comes up? Well, that's a good question. And there, there are, we get into tons of little details where the UCMG could be, J could be tweaked and can be modified. And, uh, you know, it, it's always, you know, a sticky wicket when you get legislators involved and coming down. Like, for example, we saw Kirsten Gillibrand, Senator Gillibrand, get involved and basically with the sex crime cases, which, you know, if somebody commits mm, a sex crime, sure. hold them accountable. But again, you have to preserve their rights. And what's happened now is that in America, you have the presumption of innocence. The government has to prove their case against you. But in sex crime cases, now the individual, the accused, must prove that they're innocent. This is an absolute bastardization of the system. So, you know, you want to have oversight. You want to make sure it's done right. But there are some simple things that can be done. So, for example, if you have a jury, make sure that they have to be a unanimous jury. Like in capital cases, they only need three quarters of the case or the jury to convict. So if you're a part of the non-convict portion, now all of a sudden you put your own career on the line because everybody else said, nope, that individual is guilty. Now you're sitting here like, wait a second. And so this is where figuring out the jury pool is a very interesting piece because think about, it. you know, you sat on a jury and if you were a civilian, you would go, you'd get called in for jury duty. You'd go through voir dire where the attorneys get to figure out if you're the type of guy they want on the jury or not. And then you'd sit there with a bunch of other people you've never met before in your life. You would vote your conscience based upon what you believe the, uh, mm -hmm. this individual did and whether or not it was in keeping with the law or not. And then afterwards, you would leave. You would never see any of these individuals yep. ever again, or the likelihood is very slim. Now, in the UCMJ, You'd get selected, and guess what? You could be sitting there with your boss, and if you disagree with your boss, and you're like not guilty, and your boss like, really? I thought you were looking at getting promoted. I thought you were looking at that assignment. Weren't you talking to me about all these various things you want to do in your career? Well, now all of a sudden, you're going home, and you're talking to your wife like, look, I, I just don't think they're guilty, and, and now all of a sudden, your family's like, hey, don't ruin your career. You've got a stellar career. Don't go, don't go out here and be this Superman fighting for a guy that may very well be guilty. You don't know. Yeah, don't throw away your Now, whether, whether or not that, whether or not, exactly, whether or not that actually happens, the, the possibility of it happening, all of a sudden it takes away the purely mm -hmm. impartial juror because they're thinking about their own career, their own outcome. And so there, there's, you know, for example, that a situation like that, which could be remedied is, you get a bunch of old guys like like me and well not so much you but a medium age guy that you know we're no longer in the United States military and but we understand what it's like to be in combat and we could come out and we can address certain issues and we can look at this from a warrior standpoint but without the trappings of being beholden to the armed forces this would give a little bit more objectivity for the individual but, you know, there's there are certain things that all of this have to be looked so what at. Are you saying, and again, are you saying calling the veterans leadership. as jurors then? Is that what you Okay. Sure. Absolutely. There, there's a, there are ways to remedy this. But again, you know, the, the way the system's set up, it supports yeah. the senior leadership. So why would they want to change it? It's a hard thing to change. It's like, wh why would congressmen want to vote yeah. for term limits? You know, it's, and, it goes and against it's their like, best uh, interest. Like you said before, there's a narrative that's already been painted on how things are and how things are, you know, are going. It, it, I think it's interesting, the whole sexual assault thing. So uh, I saw something the other day. It was saying like 95% of sexual assault cases that go up for court martial or something like that are dismissed. And people are like, that's the military not taking it seriously. And I'm like, eh, I think that's showing you that the battalion commanders and stuff are taking it too seriously and even forwarding complaints that they don't believe are actually true, but they're not going to stop the process. Cause how's that look? If a battalion commander goes, Hey, I don't believe this actually happened. I'm not going to allow this to go forward. And because right. of that, 
I think we've seen a lot of cases come forward that would never like, there's no chance that that's the, the person could be convicted guilty. That's like not true at all, which has caused our, and, and I, I don't think people really look at it that way that that's why we have these like crazy kind of rates for people getting off on sexual assault cases and stuff like that. Yep. Um, Hey, Justin, yeah. can I just pause you for a second? I want to get uh, my for cable sure, here. My battery's running low. Hang on. Hope you're able to edit out uh, the breaks and the oh, dog attacks. I'll leave the dogs the in. I'll, I'll cut this little piece out, though. Yeah, that's no biggie. Sometimes I like yesterday. I did a live broadcast, but I am uh, I am a YouTube University person. I have I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I have learned all of this stuff by like creating a podcast and editing and all that via YouTube. And so, <laughs> uh, it's a real hit and miss sometimes. Like I feel. I, I think the audience knows, and I think it's probably sometimes for some of them, it's probably interesting to watch me grow over time. And, uh, you know, especially guys that have listened from the beginning of the podcast to when it was just, just audio only and garbage audio at that. Now that I've gone back and listened to it, you know, uh, you, you know, the things I've learned over <laughs> a year to improve the quality and stuff, it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, I can t- I'll take that stuff out persistence that's a key I to tell success everybody, I'm like hey look no matter what like people that want to get into this kind of podcasting or social media or something like that that world i'm like it's just you have to be consistent you have to bring quality content and you have to do like like little things just to make your stuff a little better like i went and bought lights like actual studio kind of box lights and stuff like that to make you know it's little things like that that just improves like buying Smart. nicer microphones you know, rather than recording off my cell phone or something. And, um, yeah, that nice wardrobe. Yeah. I don't know. I, it's funny. I, um, I, I, before I record a session, I go back and I look at my videos to see what shirts I wore on the last ones to make sure I'm not like wearing the same shirt. Like every time, cause I'm a, a black t-shirt and like shorts right. guy. That's like basically all I ever wear, you know, most of the time. So yeah, it's funny though. Right. But, um, but back to this, man, it's, uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming on and talking through some of this. I think a lot of people, you know, you hear about some of these cases on TV and I'm one of those people where I hear about it and I'm like, man, that person's a real piece of shit, you know? And you, you don't really sure. fully understand that you're not getting the full story all the time. And I, you would think that being in the military would cause a lot of people to come out and, like hear stories and realize they're not getting the full story yet because the, obviously the media, the journalists and stuff aren't privy to all the information, you know, that's, that is involved in some of these cases. So you're just kind of getting updates on the go. And, um, it's easy to fall into that habit. Like, Oh yeah, yeah, those are a bunch of assholes. They shouldn't have done what they did. And, and I, I appreciate you and your organization like coming on and, you know, you coming on and talking about how the rights of the military member are so much different than like the civilian or they are treated so much differently than on the civilian side. And it shouldn't be like that. You know, that whole presumption of innocence and stuff. And you're completely right. Someone does something wrong or they get charged for doing something wrong. It's automatically like them having to defend themselves and like prove that they didn't do it rather than someone proving that they did do it. You know, they'll take uh, this, the flimsiest, flimsiest of evidence to say that you did do something wrong. Whereas you have to fight real hard and bring solid evidence to prove that you didn't do anything wrong. And it's kind of ridiculous. It is. And it's unfortunate because, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but when we have individuals who voluntarily swear to support and defend our rights, and by God, certainly they must have their rights defended uh, as paramount above everybody else's. And yet 
they don't. They, they get them trampled. And uh, that's where preserve an individual's right. If, if somebody's done something wrong, hold them accountable. I'll tell you, even, even some of these warriors that have done things wrong, they acknowledge it. Like, yeah, look, I did this wrong. Hold me accountable for that. Got it. But I didn't commit murder. And yet it's like, well, it doesn't matter. If you've done one thing wrong, you've done everything wrong. And uh, again, we see the prejudice against our special operators. And it, a lot of times it's just jealousy. And it's like, listen, you, you could have gone out. You could have gone Force Recon. You could have gone MARSOC, mm -hmm. but you chose not to. And so there's this perception that these these top tier warriors are, are looking down on everybody else. Where the, whereas the reality is they're not. They're looking out trying to get bad guys. And, it, you know, th this prejudice and this concern you have, this frustration that you didn't do whatever you had to do to go become this extraordinary warrior, that's, your, that's the issue you're having with yourself. That's the argument that 40, 50-year-old whoever is having with your 20-year-old self as to why you didn't do that it has nothing to do with those individuals. So it's almost like, oh, look, they stumbled, they tripped, they fell. Ah, see, yeah. I knew they weren't all that good. Yeah. I knew they were bad guys. And it, it plays into a sad narrative. And it's something that you know, we, we, we have to, again, preserve well, the, the presumption also, of innocence. A lot of times these special operations or more like specialized units are cowboy in nature and, you know, kind of feel like they're, they can do whatever they want. This is, I'm saying this is the perception of people on the outside. And, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I know what you're saying there. So, I would ask then if someone fall, finds themselves overseas and something like this occur, something happens, what should they do to protect their own rights? Like what's the steps? To, like if I'm suddenly find myself involved in the UCMJ and, and there may be some serious things coming down the, down the pipe, what should I do to like better defend myself in court? Yeah. Well, well the first thing you have to do is make sure that, you know, you don't have to, testify to anything. You have the right to remain silent. And you also have the right to have counsel. And sometimes that's really hard mm -hmm. to get civilian counsel. I, I'll just, I'll bring up one other case. Uh, Michael Williams, who will fight for a pardon for this warrior as well. Michael Williams uh, is a highly trained ranger who uh, actually left active duty. And then after 9-11, felt the desire to serve, went back on active duty, was leading soldiers, and because he was a uh, so highly skilled, respected, and trained soldier, he was put into a staff sergeant's position as a sergeant. He was a squad leader. They were in some serious house-to-house -house fighting in Sadr City, and they were engaging the enemy left and right. They, you know, Muqtadar al-Sadr had been doing some horrible things against U.S. forces. It was just really bad situation, and. Uh, they were moving and they were on the flank of this other unit. And as they were moving forward, they had to move quickly to make sure, make sure they were, weren't exposing this other unit's flank. And uh, they were taking out the enemy. They come across this individual in a building. Uh, his weapon is still hot. He's sweaty. He's dirty. He's got ammunition weapons all around him. Obviously, he had just been engaging U.S. forces. They grab this guy and they, they're like, well, what do we do? Well, they didn't have the ability to detain POWs. They were on the move and there was no process in place. So the sergeant made the call to kill him. Now, we can argue back and forth as to whether or not he made the right decision, but this is similar to like a Marcus Luttrell in the lone survivor situation where, you know, Luttrell will tell you, look, we had these two detainees and we let them go. And all his entire highly trained SEAL force ended up getting slaughtered except for Marcus Luttrell. And his the question, you know, what would you have done? He goes, I probably would have killed them. And so this is where you had this warrior made this decision. Similar situation happened a little bit later. He told one of his soldiers to kill this other detainee. And again, all in the heat of combat, all in the middle of house to house, close combat. And he was held accountable for it. And they charged him with murder. And in his situation, they detained him in Kuwait. They put him in a wooden box surrounded by barbed wire and concentrate. Like he had to defecate, urinate in a plastic bottle. And he was in, in that situation what? for over 150 days. Holy crap. And, yeah. So him, exactly. So him even having access to 
not just civilian attorneys or some attorneys that could come work with him while he's in Kuwait in this wooden box was near impossible. Uh, him getting access to witnesses while the witnesses are back in the United States, near impossible. And so he has a military attorney who comes in and says, listen, you know, just plead guilty. We'll get you a reduced sentence, all the rest. And, you know, he doesn't know better. None of us do. When we're sitting here as warriors, we're not, we have no idea of what our rights are, what, you know, we're, we're being told what you did was wrong and it was horrible and it was evil. And you know what, maybe he was wrong. And, and, but that's, that should be determined by a jury of his peers who've been in similar situation that can decide whether or not his actions were appropriate or inappropriate. And he has a strong legal defense and then decide were there mitigating circumstances, were there extenuating circumstances, not yeah. every situation is the same. And again, he's acting under the laws of armed conflict, not the rule of law. So anyway, he, he actually was released from prison six years ago. He's doing well. Michael Williams is out there. He's a partner in a uh, biomedical firm. He continues to do well, but he still sure. wants to get his rights back. He still wants to be allowed to vote and to own firearms. And so we're, we're pushing his case forward, too, to make sure that uh, he receives a pardon. But to your point is, you know, what do you do when you're in that situation? Well, there's it's very there, you have limited options as to what you're being allowed to do. And this is where as soon as we find out about these cases, uh, we try and figure out if they have any legal defense. And a lot of times they'll, we, the cases get brought to our attention by the attorneys. We don't assign the attorneys. The attorneys come to us and say, Hey, we've got this case. And then our board decides whether or not we're going to fund that. And, uh, it, it's just, it's a horrible situation to be in because if you think about it, some of these guys, they go straight from the b battlefield, the pretrial confinement, and, and they may be dealing with TBI, post-traumatic stress, what have you. And then right from there, they're put in prison. And, you know, they, these guys, mm -hmm. they don't get to see the light of day. And it's tough yeah, for them. It's no, it very can, tough. I can definitely see that. I think, you know, one of the biggest issues that you have is the fact that the average military service member has zero ideas of what rights that they're allowed, what rights that they have, the processes that they can, you know, that they're afforded. And it, I can see that I could see how someone can be easily talked into saying something they shouldn't have said, agreeing to a, a route on this case that they shouldn't have agreed to. And, and this isn't just in the military. This is in the civilian sector, too. I think the legal system is so convoluted with, like, crazy shit that has just happened over the 200-and-something years of our country of people adding to the legal system that it's become so confusing that the average person doesn't even know what they are legally allowed to do and not do and that it causes all these headaches down the road. You know, like, I don't know. It's – is there is – Yeah. And, and here's – and here's the thing, for, for the most part, again, you're, you're going to get assigned an attorney and they're probably going to be a junior, junior in rank, probably maybe their first, second case defense attorney. And think about it. These guys are all a part of this closed system. So if they put up too much of a fight, mm -hmm. how much is that going to affect their career? When all of a sudden the prosecution and defense are saying, hey, look, let's get a plea deal here. Let's get this thing over. And all of a sudden the defense attorney is like, whoa, hold on a second. I want to fight this. Like, what? We've got a renegade here. So you have to get, again, somebody who's outside the system, a civilian attorney to come in here who yeah. has no ties to the military, who usually has been a former JAG, so understands the UCMJ, but then has had a civilian practice and understands that there's more to the whole legal system than just what they've learned there. But the problem is for a junior enlisted guy to get some high paid attorney out there, they're going to have to mortgage their house. They're mm -hmm. going to have to, you know, beg, borrow from their, their friends and family. Like it's almost impossible for them to afford an attorney that yeah. would give them the proper defense. And for the most part, if they're thinking, well, I'm not guilty. And what are they going to do to me? Well, they're going to put you away in prison. And to believe mm -hmm. that. Because again, you, you look, you, you drink the Kool-Aid, you come in here and you're like, I, I, I love, you know, one, two, three, four, I love the Marine Corps. And you're not going to think the organization would turn against you. And it's not necessarily the organization. It's these prosecutors. Mm -hmm. It's the, the UCMJ, which is set up with the presumption of guilt. 
And, it, and it's a tough situation for these guys because they, they're going through a psychological challenge of disbelief. They thought for certain the Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy was going to stand behind them. And it yeah. simply is not the case. Do you Does your website have like resources, like a list of like resources that people can – can go through to to know their legal rights within the UCMJ. You know, it we don't, and that's a, actually a good point. We probably should add that to our website. And most of the time, by the time somebody is actually get access uh, incarcerated that. or is uh, right, yeah. they don't have access to the internet. But that's where you know, interestingly, usually within prison or in detention facilities, you know, people know several different attorneys' names, and they they put those names out there. Uh, you know, two that have, for the pardons are uh, Colby Volke and John Marr uh, with his associate, associate Kevin Miklashek. Mm-hmm. And uh, these these gentlemen, they, they've been working tirelessly, putting together packages, fighting for our warriors, trying to get them pardons, trying to get justice, trying to preserve their rights. And uh, they, I'll, I'll tell you what, they're, they're underpaid for the amount of time and work and effort that they put in. And we try to pay them, and we I'm telling you, the, we, we, we're lucky if we're covering their expenses, and that's where we're constantly trying to get more support, people making donations to UAP.org to try and get the funds to pay these attorneys and to make sure we're raising the awareness and we're, we're keeping the elected officials abreast of what's going on. But it's, uh, it, it's one of those things that nobody thinks about this until it's too late. Yeah. So it's, a, it's challenging for, for the warriors and – you know, God bless a lot of these attorneys, attorneys that, uh, you know, Phil Stackhouse, another one who uh, leans forward. Uh, we've got uh, Stackhouse, Volke and McGee working on the Marsoc 3 case as well. And uh, look, all, all of these guys, they're, they're overworked, underpaid. And it's really they fortunately they, they're good attorneys and they have other cases. But um, they, it's, a, it's a labor of love for these guys and they they really they, they love these warriors and they love the constitution and they fight for their rights well for me i think it's it's good to know that there's people out there that are you know fully bought into it that are like ready to stand up and and defend somebody and um man it's just a you're right it's such a tough situation because you could be just doing your thing in Iraq or whatever. And then the next thing you know, you're in a box and then you're in a prison cell and then you're like, what the hell is going on? And, and, and most of us are ignorant, completely ignorant to the legal system of the military. So it's like, you probably don't even realize the steps that you need to take or the box you need to check to, to defend yourself, which is, uh, it's just extremely unfortunate. You know, maybe let me, let me, if you don't mind, ahead, I just want to bring up our, our one last case that we're fighting for uh, pardon, uh, Sergeant Derek Miller, uh, another stellar performer. He was actually in the National Guard who volunteered to go and serve. And while he was overseas, he, he, he left his two little girls behind, you know, back here in the States to go serve our country. Goes over there. They're at a checkpoint. They identify an individual that was very suspicious. That they believe was transporting weapons to the enemy. The higher up said, let him go. So they let him go. The very next day, they see the same individual within friendly lines with two other people scouting around. Hmm. And so Sergeant Miller brings this to the attention of his platoon commander and says, hey, I, I want to go interrogate this guy. This, this is just not right. So he gets permission, he goes, grabs this guy, has an interpreter and another junior soldier with him. The other two scouts take off. And I'll tell you why I, I'm, I'm certain that they were Taliban uh, scouts uh, because of what followed on as they start interrogating this individual, like, you know, what are you doing here? He goes, ah, you know, I'm a plumber. What do you mean you're a plumber? Where, where are your plumbing tools? Oh, I, did I say plumber? I meant electrician. Okay. Where's your electrician's yeah. tools? Uh, I, I don't have any in it. Okay. Well, you know, we saw you driving this vehicle the other day. He goes, Oh no, I, I, I don't know how to drive. Like we just took these car keys out of your pocket. So all of his lies were being exposed he started getting agitated. He realized the gig was up and he ends up reaching for Sergeant Derek Miller's weapon. Derek fires, kills the individual, acted in self-defense. The unit at the time hears this gunshot and everybody's stand too, like what's going on? So everybody's Kevlar on, facing outboard, trying to figure out what's happening. Within a short period of time after that, all of a sudden they come under RPG, direct fire attacks, and it was all very targeted, mm-hmm. which meant they had to have scouts inside knowing 
here's where leadership is, here's where supply ammo is here. Yeah. So they had a very targeted attack. Fortunately, because of Derek's actions, everybody was ready for the attack. Not one individual was harmed. But after that happened, all of a sudden, they've got this, what seems like an unarmed civilian laying here dead inside the compound. And so they say, well, what happened? And uh, the soldier and the interpreter both said, look, he went for Derek's weapon and Derek shot him in self-defense. And the prosecutor or the CID says, you sound like you're colluding here. Sounds like you're an accomplice to this crime. And they start pressuring these guys. Both of these guys ended up changing their testimony. And it's believed one of them, the interpreter, they said, hey, I, I thought you wanted to uh, have U.S. citizenship. You're not going to get there with this path. Mm -hmm. So they pressured him and he's now a U.S. citizen, but he changed his testimony against Derek. And this other soldier, he was supposed to be leaving active duty and going on this prepaid honeymoon with his wife. And they said, looks like you're going to have to give that honeymoon up if you decide that you want to plead this way. He ends up changing his testimony. So they pressured these guys to get the testimony they want. And here's what's really bad. His case is almost identical to First Lieutenant Michael Behenna's, where a detainee is being inter uh, interrogated or questioned, and the detainee attacks the warrior. The warrior acts in self-defense. But unlike where they had a forensic expert and a body, this time they said, you know what, we're not keeping the body. We don't want to go through that mess again. So not only did they not have the body, there was no forensics, no autopsy, but they didn't didn't even take hmm. photographs of the crime scene. And they had MPs sitting yeah. here on the base. Nobody did any of that. And they just railroaded Derek Miller. They put him away for life. Fortunately, we were able to come in again with the help of Justice for Warrior Caucus, which is headed up by Congressman Louis Gohmert. And we were able to fight, get him clemency, get his, his sentence reduced, put him up and he was able to gain parole. And we were able to get him out. But Again, there's, we're still fighting for him to be pardoned. And uh, again, an, another great individual with great family and, you know, amazing family, man. And if I, you know, just give some perspective on all of these individuals from a personal perspective. So we give stipends to these warriors who've been wrongfully accused and unjustly convicted so that, you know, they can buy magazines, run in shoes, you know, snacks or something while they're in prison. Sergeant Derek Miller used every penny of the money that he received to maintain phone contact with his two daughters. And he was in there for a decade and he would call them two, three times a week so that when, cause he knew someday he would get out and he wanted to make sure his little girls knew daddy loved them and that who daddy was so that when he showed yeah. up, they weren't like, Hey, who's this man? Like, and he fully em embraced them and, and was able to work right back into their lives without issues. Staff Sergeant Gibbs, He's got a, a 12 year old little boy. Same thing. You know, he's maintains the contact with him via the phone. And, you know, they, they talk all the time. Staff Sergeant Bales, you know, this horrible monster. His wife moved from Seattle to Kansas so that she could live there outside the prison in Leavenworth so that she could maintain her relationship with her husband and that her two children, both of their two children, could actually go into the prison and Bob could do homework with his two children. Like these, these are not evil people and very few of the people that join our armed forces are. And so this is the, the type of context that very few people get a chance to see. And now I'm fortunate in that I've gotten a chance to meet these warriors. Uh, I, I maintain contact with them. I speak to them on a weekly basis. And it's, it's sad when you see, again, individuals who are good people, who are trying to do the best by their families. And, and quite frankly, a lot of times marriages don't yeah, last when you get to I mean, on her you know, prison for life. Yeah. And so she's, you know, an amazing person. She decided to stick by his side, but most of the time people get divorced. Uh, but fortunately, you know, they allow access to the children, but it doesn't mean that you're living in the same area. Like they're living all over the place, but at least they get phone contact. They, they don't even get to do a Skype or a FaceTime. So you don't yeah. even get to see the visual. They just, they get to speak on the phone. And even that, the phone calls are ridiculously expensive. And uh, but again, they they commit their money to try and maintain the relationship crazy, with their man. children. I couldn't imagine something like that. I couldn't imagine being imprisoned and uh, kind of dealing with that that whole man. 
what a again I, I i think the important lesson here is that people need to understand their rights maybe in our annual training curriculum we can take out one of our fucking like std classes or something like that and maybe get in a legal <laughs> class where people understand uh, hold, all right all right listen okay rewind the back when you were lance yeah. corporal okay would you have paid I mean, attention to that class? No, but no I mean, at way. least, at least <laughs> no put way. the information out there. If it's if the individual doesn't want to take the information, that's the, that's on them. But yeah. But, but think about what you're saying. You're telling our warriors, listen, you need to be more concerned about going to prison no, 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 than no, killing I'm the saying, enemy. What I'm saying is that I think people need to have a better understanding of their rights overall. And I'm talking, I'm talking military members with the UCMJ, and I'm talking the average citizen and how they. Yep they they approach like talking to a police officer or, or something like that because a lot of people don't know what what a police officer can do to detain them what stops you know what are the lines here like if i cross this i'm definitely getting detained you know a lot of people don't even realize that there's certain things that are milestones and stuff that are set that if you know you cross this line this True. is this has to happen that's the law right. and if and if and if you believe you're innocent then you're saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell yeah. you anything you want to know. Like, why, why would yeah. I be concerned? I'm innocent. And and then all of a sudden, the system gets turned on them. Yeah, and, that's, and that's a, scary. Again, I, I, I learned so much, and I've, I've mentioned it on the podcast a couple times. I've learned so much from taking a business law class at Miracosta College right outside Camp Pendleton and learning, and learning just Great about school. the, like, just the basics of, like, what your rights are and what – what a tort is and what, what assault actually is, you know, stuff like that. Like things that people throw words around right, like they know right. what they're talking about. <laughs> the reality is there's a very set definition for these things. And, you know, honestly it would help, it would help some of the hysteria that you get whenever there's like a case or something that comes on TV and people are trying to try that case in the Facebook comments, you know, rather than like, let it play out, not understanding how <laughs> the judicial system works, you know? And it's, uh, you're right, though. Exactly. You're right. As, as an 18 or 19 year old turks. PFC or Lance Corporal, I'd be sitting there like, ugh, toe dip in, try not to fall asleep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly right. And and you know what? And that's where I I want my warriors mm -hmm. focusing on being warriors. And these guys, 99.9% .9 of the time, they follow rules of, rules of engagement that are so restrictive that actually put their sure. own lives in harm's way. And I'll tell you, you know, when, when you're a junior officer and, and you're leading warriors into combat, I have never once had any concern about my warriors being aggressive. These guys were some of the greatest human beings around and they, they were just aggressive. I mean, Hey, we had, I was concerned about them getting into bar fights and getting in trouble already. So I knew when we put them on the battlefield, they were like, thank God, now I can go destroy bad guys. But in the back of my mind, I was like, Will they be able to turn it off? Yeah. And that was always a concern. And right after my first combat engagement, and I saw that these guys immediately, they, they were performing first aid on guys that they had just taken out. Like in the first Gulf War, they're blowing guys out of tanks, and then they're sitting there putting tourniquets on these guys' legs. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Only in America do we raise such amazing individuals that there, there's no class that says, hey, an enemy combatant, when they're no longer an enemy command, you have to save their life. And yet the human nature of the American citizen is a empathetic, sympathetic, amazing individual that knows how to turn it on and off. And that's why they must be given the presumption of innocence. And and again, are we going to be, are we going to find that, yeah, you know what, we were wrong in that case. Okay. I, I'd rather be proven wrong than treat someone like a criminal yeah. And then be proven wrong. Like, or worse, have this guy go to prison for life. And you know what we find out 10, 20 years later, like, oh shoot, mm -hmm. you know what? We were wrong. And and this is where in a couple of our cases, there's a, a statute of limitation on where you can be held criminally liable for making false statements. And it's usually about five years. And we go back out to a lot of these people that have been coerced into making false testimony and saying, hey. Now that you're no longer under jeopardy, could you tell us the truth? And But even still, now an individual has been put in prison for five years because of a false statement. And why did that individual give this false statement? Because they didn't want to spend five, 10, yeah. 20 years in prison. And and a lot of times, you know, a young 18-year-old kid 
an impressionable kid is as great as they, they may be. Mom, dad, everybody else is saying, you tell them what the hell yeah, save yourself. You know, they want to hear because you right. You know, they don't want to see their, their kid thrown away, you know, lose their life because For they're sure. trying to protect someone else. So, you know, and, and look, not everybody's like that. You know, there are a lot of people say, hey, do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. But we also know a lot of kids have joined the armed forces that their families didn't want them to join. And, you know, that's a contentious issue right there. And now all of a sudden, you know, they're saying you don't owe them anything. You know, stop being a hero. I told you not to go in in the first place. Get the hell out of there. Yeah. Let's go. Come home. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on and talking about, uh, you know, one, giving us the introduction Thank to you, uh, a little bit about your background and your family. That was super interesting. And I know people are really going to enjoy that. I might have to have you come back on and <laughs> we'll get into more about that. Uh, but coming on and highlighting these cases and, and, you know, for me, I think the biggest benefit of this is going to be, again, bringing awareness out there that people don't understand their own rights and that they can easily fall into one of these traps if they're not careful. Because when you're talking to a, a legal person, if you're talking to someone in a legal manner, like this is like, this is going to have to, this is going to come up again in the future. You have to know what you're saying. And if you say the wrong thing, then you're fucked. And that's how it is in the legal world. They have a certain way of doing stuff. And if you do, if you say, you know, one thing incorrectly, that right there can come back to haunt you. And, um, look, we see this in the media all the time. Somebody will make a statement and they'll take that yep. clip out. And even if the same sentence has some information that disputes what was said yep. here, well, that doesn't matter. We got that. We, yep. we got the sound bite that we want. And, we're going to nail yeah, this individual to the cross. Salience. I really hope, I really hope that I'm, you know, I'm going to look into some stuff after, after we get done with this discussion, but I'd like to see some of these prosecutors that are doing illegal stuff to get, you know, to get a prosecution, see them, you know, receiving some kind of consequence for that action, because that's not, it's not a nothing thing. You're affecting someone's life. You're talking about putting people in prison for years or the rest of their life. And, you know, and that should be, if you mess that up, if you're the person responsible for messing something like that up, then you should, you know, definitely be facing some consequences for that because it's not, it's not a joke or anything like that. It's a, it's a, it's someone's life. And, um, I mean, honestly, you have to be a piece of shit human being to, to knowingly leave out evidence that you think is going to exonerate someone just so you can get the win. You know, that's just crazy. I don't know. Yeah. that That's, that's the most disturbing part when we see that, that, that exonerating information or what's yeah. called ex exculpatory information is hidden. That That's for sure. It, it's shocking. It really, it, it, and it's one of those things that I, I never would have imagined. You know, you would imagine an officer in the United States armed forces, they, they swear to the same uh, oath that every officer does. It's not like, Oh, here's the infantry officer's oath. And here's the, the JAG officer's oath. It's the same oath. We're still, you know, held by the same, you know, bound by the same commitment to the constitution and yet, somewhere along the line, it, there's just a, I guess, you know, bad behavior is that, you know, which is tolerated or mm -hmm. ignored. And that basically it's what happens here. Sure. And it's, it's disappointing, For really sure. disappointing. Well, uh, before we go, I'd like to give you an opportunity to plug whatever, um, you know, your own organization and stuff like that. Uh, what social media sites uh, would you like people to check out? And what's your website one more time? Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Well, our website is easy. It's UAP.org. And uh, you can go there. You can learn more information about all the cases we just talked about here. And uh, certainly we, we'd love to have anybody who can make donations, anybody who can commit anything. It's a tax deductible donation. We're a 501c3 organization. We even have a store right now where people can buy some great apparel and all the rest. Great time. Holiday shopping. Come in, make a tax deductible donation, get some apparel. Uh, we're on Facebook as uh, UAP Inc. And uh, I believe we're on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Parlor. So certainly please follow us, learn more information, ask questions, because I know a lot of times it's like, well, wait a second. I, mm -hmm. I, I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. And, you know, we're, we're more than happy to clarify and to make sure the information gets out there. But the next step, which is really important, is then – Take the information and share it with your elected officials. Let your congressmen know and let your senators know. Let the president know that these warriors deserve to have their rights protected. Defend the defender. 
And the more information that keeps going out there, where you take information and you put it out there to support our warriors, then number one, we get these guys out of prison. We get this these uh, prosecutions taken away from over their head. And then the other part is that it sends a clear message to the, those working within the Uniform Code of Military Justice, whether it be commanders who are acting with unlawful command influence, prosecutors who are acting with prosecutorial misconduct, or investigators who are basically trying to work for convictions as opposed to exposing the truth, that mm -hmm. it's not going to stand. And that's that's the whole purpose of our organization is to keep people honest for sure and for preserve sure. rights. And I'd love to have you come back on maybe in a couple of months or something like that and give give us an update on the uh, Marsoc three and how that's all all that's going. And maybe we'll dig into your background a little bit more. Love um, it for everyone out there. Again, if you want to his, I will put that uh, I will put your guys's website link in the show notes and uh your instagram handles are ua patriots and that's on both instagram and twitter my instagram page is former action guys and at jkramer graphics both of those and my website's jkramergraphics.com make sure to hit me up and uh thanks again for coming on the show man awesome thanks so hey, much justin hey, really appreciate it it's great bye all right thank you